talent for different reasons, and this week was no exception. We love underdogs here at the Blaze of the Week, like the tortoise against the hare. Wouldn't you love to take a weed eater to that? Uh, he's just a shell of his former self anyway. How about Damon versus Goliath? The Raptors slayed the Rockets and Bulls in the same week. Davis Sons got all these the referees and they, their girls got these referees wearing diapers. They can't be mad themselves and make a call and set up for themselves. I can't believe that. <laughs> oh, boy. He's having more fun than humans should be allowed. Forget the politics, forget the officials. Let's just enjoy some great plays. Look at the play by Matt Sundini. We call that a dramatic pause in the television industry. Get it. Ahead for Shaw. Again to the line. Failed to get it out. And Randy Gillen's shot is deflected to the corner. Allison goes in after, but it's played back out to center again by Simon and pitched back in. The Moose with the early advantage as Robert Dirk is back to play it behind his own net. Vipers have yet to get it into the Manitoba zone. Now Simon spins it around the dasher and in deep. Detroit will get a change. Rando plays it away for his defense. In on the four check. Again, it's Simon working it off the wall. Tried to get it to the point of Bobby J. Long wrist shot deflected on the way by Tardis. And that one ends up in the corner as he had a pass free right to Vincent Riendo's doorstep. That was a tricky little chance for the first touch for Riendo to start this game. Travis Thiessen sends it deep into the Detroit zone. And Jeff Parrott with the long headman pass at center off the heel of the stick of Patrice Tardis. John Tolaire, the rookie extraordinaire, are back to center for Manitoba into the Detroit zone. Throws it to the corner. Russ Romanek in after it. Bumped there by Bobby J. Puck behind the Detroit net. Romanek comes over. Bobby J. continues to seal him off and then pokes it to the corner where Tardif gets to it and lifts it to center. The race is on. Michelle Mangeau back after it. It's played away from him. And then reversed away from his forecheck. Donnelly feeding it in front, and that was broken up by Tolaire. Behind the net, Eric Dubois sends it up the dasher. Manjot got to the point but couldn't keep it in. And the Vipers forced to touch up. Shaw backing it into his own zone. Rink wide for McLaughlin. Ahead now for Drulli. And away come the Vipers to center. The Detroit captain beats Sampson off across the line. His wrist shot blocked. Puck right to the slot. That swept to the corner quickly. Good defensive play there by Jeff Riccardi. Puck comes right back into the crease. And Riendo. Got his stick on it, but really didn't clear it out of harm's way. Defense comes to the rescue and does that. Stevens in his own zone, bothered by Drulia. Now Riccardi plays it off the back wall, and Steve Wilson throws it into the crowd. No score early on at the Palace. Manitoba and Detroit. On all fours, make the save. Not the most orthodox stop, but <laughs> as coaches say, the thing they want their goaltender to do is stop the puck. Scott McCrory eludes a check in the corner in the Manitoba zone, then gets up on one knee, plays it ahead. Around it comes near side, Travis Thiessen ahead for Stevens. He goes up the glass over Jeff Parrott and back into the Detroit zone. Robert Dirk after it, waving his stick as if he was just going to lumberjack it out. Instead, wires it around far side. And it eludes Scott Arneal at the point. Parrott at the Detroit line. Nearly lost the handle ahead for Kessa. He lets that go through and into the Manitoba zone. Back to get it. Steve Wilson. Simon forces him and he throws it off the back wall. Thiessen with it there. Had it knocked away by Simon. Kessa nearly got to it. Again in front of the Manitoba net. Wilson plays it away. Here comes Mike Stevens. Rugged power forward with a long wrist shot that Parrott juggles. That one almost rolled over his shoulder. And he's forced to cover it up as it came side of the net. Not the most artistic goaltending in either end early on, but we're still scoreless. Well, maybe they're nervous. They know it's coast to coast in Canada. You called him a power forward. He almost powered that one right through and over. Young Bernie, Rich Perrant. Vince Riendo, who played last year in Germany after assorted stops in the previous year or two before that. 
thought, at least at the outset of the season, that he might get the majority of the work, but Jean Perron deciding against that has given young Fred Brathwaite a great deal of work as they have split time exclusively this year. Puck along the far boards. Taken in behind the net of Laughlin, battling hard, gets back up and comes up with it. He'll use the glass, and a la Peter McLaughlin, the rookie out of Harvard, he just keeps it simple defensively. He clears, but that's an icing call as Eric Dubois is back to touch up. Michel Mangeau, the third leading IHL scorer all time amongst active players coming into tonight's action, trailing only Jock Callender and Dave McKaylick of the Cleveland Lumberjacks. All time, the number 16 scorer in the 52-year history of the International Hockey League. Battling back from injury that kept out of most of last season, had a good playoff. He's played very, very well this season for the Vipers. Last couple of years have been lost years for Mangeau. Assorted facial injuries two years ago, and then a knee injury that kept him out of all the 22 games in the regular season last year. Speaking of injuries, Brad Shaw battling back spasms tonight, handles it behind the Detroit Blue Line. Sends it around. Battling for it there is Sansonoff, who just reverses it again near side. Drulia comes over, chops it up the wall. That'll come out to center. Jeff Loader handles it there. Back the other way. They rule on side as it's spun into the Detroit zone. Dirk went after it behind the net. Savaglia to center. Ahead for Sansonoff. Knocked off his stick at the blue line. It stays right on the stripe until Loader comes over and pushes it to center. Jeff Riccardi comes back after it as Rulia hacked it into the Manitoba zone, and now Scott Allison just feeds it to center. Just over five minutes into it at the Palace, the Manitoba Moose and Detroit Vipers, no score. Todd Simon on the far side out of his own zone, looking to break out. Nice little saucer pass to Bobby Jay, who stick handles into the zone. Pinched off along the boards, but he moves it ahead for Ed Ward. Ward battling Wilson, and a couple of big boys there as they bring it to the corner. Donnelly digs it out. Donnelly just had it swept off his stick. Fed up the boards as Gillen got it out to center and racing after his Pankowitz. Simon coming back to help out, plays it away. Sent in front as Pankowitz picked it off on the back wall, but nobody there. And now Bobby Jay ahead for Ed Ward. Ward played for the first time in four games after a knee bruise and a sorted stitches above the eye. Dumps it in, but they rule from the wrong side of center ice. They rule that's an icing call and then has Ed Ward a little bit perplexed and can't say as I blame him there. Tough one, actually. It has been an interesting season for Manitoba. If you take their 28 games to date, you can pretty much split them right down the middle and see two different teams. They have found it here in the second half of the first third of the season, if you can follow that. And meanwhile, Detroit has struggled, relatively speaking, at home when you compare it to their road record. A tale of two teams for each team. Puck into the Manitoba zone. Phil Crow bumps Chris Tock. Tock handles it to the near side. Up the board, the defensive pressure comes from the point as Shaw pinches in. Now Mike Stevens handles it in the near circle and feeds it ahead. The return pass he couldn't quite handle. Tardiff had it knocked off his stick and brought in by Arneal. Arneal gets it to Stevens in the high slot, looking for anyone going to the net. It was Loader, but that was broken up by Tardiff, who just sends it back into the Manitoba zone and changes for Detroit on the go. Jeff Riccardi back to get it, formerly of Indianapolis in Las Vegas. Feeds it ahead for Stevens. Through center ice, tripped up at the blue line, a penalty coming up to Detroit was Scott Arneal. And the first power play of the game will go Manitoba's way as Al Kimmel has a hooking penalty. And it's going to go on Robert Dirk. Nearly going here, John. Better speed by Manitoba, and they're definitely taking the body here early on, trying to establish that court check. Well, the Moose played last night in Quebec and had an interesting travel schedule from there that oftentimes would have people thinking that they might not have any jump tonight. This Jean Perron coach team got here to Detroit and to their hotel around 1 o'clock this afternoon. After busing to Montreal immediately after the game in Quebec last night, they got there about 2 a.m. then flew into Detroit after getting up for a 6 a.m. wake-up. 
at around 11.30, and by the time they arrived at their hotel, it was 1 o'clock. They are not well rested, but as you mentioned, seem to have some jump. Nearly gave it up in their own zone, but now on the power play, in they come. Right to the slot. Perrant reaches with the glove, and he cannot get his stick, or can't get his glove on that one. It's one to nothing as Chris Jensen went high to beat him, and that took only 19 seconds on the Manitoba power play. Perrant has been beaten high to the glove side a few times here lately in the last few games. That is his style, the B style. The play was kind of a broken play at the blue line. Good feed to the middle. The key there for Jensen he got rid of it quickly, and, and Bernie seemed to be in between on his way down. Got a piece of it and it trickled. Looks like under his arm. I thought he had it in his trapper. It didn't touch the back of the net, but it crossed the goal line, so it's 1 0. McLaughlin just backhanding it up the boards out of his own zone, alleviates pressure with an icing call. So the Moose have the early lead. One nothing Manitoba as McLaughlin sends it again the length of the ice wide of the net and this will be the third icing call off the stick of rookie Pete McLaughlin as it's touched up the face off once again back into the Detroit zone. The Vipers would like to thank Visual Designs for their support of tonight's game. They provided the opening animation for all your animation needs and graphics expertise call Visual Designs 800-842-6604. John Perron trying to make sure that his team stays hot on the road. In the middle of a four-game road trip. Started as far east as they possibly could. Make their way back west. Tough schedule in the eye. Trying to make the most of it here on the road. Not the most geographical <laughs> advantageous trip. You go Quebec, Detroit, and, and Grand Rapids, Cincinnati. Or is it the other way around? Cincinnati, Grand Rapids. Cincinnati, Grand Rapids. Yeah, they're, they're crisscrossing. This great country. Simon leads a three-man rush into the Manitoba zone. Drops it for the trailer. Shaw, his drive, hit Corvo in front, and down he went. Back comes Pankowitz to center, as up and down for the first time tonight. Offside are the Moose. We thought we might see a wide-open style of hockey game because the Moose have been playing some pretty high-scoring games of late, at least by the 96-97 standards, and that's the first real dose of it. We have gotten, as you see, Manitoba has not had that much trouble scoring of late, but that goes hand in hand with some problems stopping their opponents as well. They're giving up the goals, but they're giving up great scoring chances as well. Talking to Jean Perron before the game, a little concerned with not only the number of shots they're giving up per game, but the quality chances that they're giving up. Both as goaltenders, Brathwaite and Riendo, with over 90% save percentages keeping the Moose in some games. Right now, the Moose with a 1-0 lead. 11.40 to go, opening period. Outlet pass up the left side all the way back into the Detroit zone. This will be an icing call as Parrott gets there first to touch up. Jeff Parrott from the Paw, Manitoba. The only Manitoba native on the Viper Club. That's right, I was going to say, John, that not only Bobby J, but Jeff Parrott going to see more ice time with Ian Herbers out. Depending on how well Brad Shaw's back responds to treatment, more ice time. Just a very solid back there as well this season. I believe his most offensive professional season saw him get all of 20 points. So you look at players like Parrott and Dirk and Bobby J, and these are guys who stay at home, get their points when they come. Don't worry about it if they don't. As Dirk rips one on net off the draw, Parrott then fires it wide short side on the carom. However, in the absence of Herbers, that leaves really Brad Shaw as the most offensive defenseman remaining. He always is the most offensive defenseman on this team, but Herbers has had a pretty nice offensive year, particularly on the power play. Yeah, Ian really picked it up, started last year in the playoffs. Was a big contributor to the playoffs offensively and carried it over this year, as you said, mostly on the power. Play. Vipers trying to clear twice up the middle, and neither time does it succeed. Talaire got a weak shot on net. Perrant steering that away, and then Donnelly had the puck behind him. He didn't see it. And the puck down low in the Detroit zone. Sean Talaire, a Manitoba native himself, able to free wheel along the near wall, brings it high, and then backhands it down low. Pass went 
right through and out to center as Jensen couldn't get his stick on it and Donnelly will dump it in. Riendo has not been very busy of late and he's out to play the puck. An early 6-2 shot advantage for Manitoba make it 6-3 as Riendo nonchalant that one into the crowd from far off the right wing boards. Bobby Jay just got it on net. I thought for a minute he nonchalanted that thing right into his net. He tried to kick it up over the crossbar and you're ready. Just barely cleared the crossbar and then cleared the grip of the glass. Started talking about the Manitoba natives, only one on the Vipers. A number of Manitoba natives here on this Manitoba Moose team and they started training camp with a number of people in camp. You see the guys who are still on the roster are Neil Gillen, Talaire, Allison, and Romanuk. They started with a good handful of almost a dozen guys hailed from Manitoba. John Brown putting this team together early on in the summer. Bobby Jay's shot from the point didn't get through traffic. He is unable to corral the return pass from Savaglia. And the Vipers turned it over. Stevens in with a long wrist shot. And then he paid the price as he collided with Bobby Jay. Perrant with the save. Puck set to the line, held in there. And oh, Eric Dubois got rocked as well. Vipers starting to throw the bodies around a little bit. Stevens along the far side, hit by Savaglia. Pulls away, but it was poked free by Pete and Ward. Springs Drulia. Drulia into the Manitoba zone using his body as a shield. Couldn't pull the trigger, but he scored anyway. Off the toe of his stick, Riendo battled it, and he lost the fight. <laughs> he misfired, but he got the job done. Not the two prettiest goals I think you'll see all year, but in talking with Steve Ludzik and Viper General Manager Rick Dudley before this one, they both said we need more ugly goals as a result of going hard to the net. And that's the sum of this play by Drulia. And you'll have two different coaching reactions. John Perron will not be happy with his goaltender, but Steve Ludzik will be very happy with the play that Pete Savaglia made on the half wall, and Edward made at the blue line to spring Drulia free. And this is exactly the kind of goal Stan Drulia needs. Drulia has the most goals of anyone in the IHL in the last three years coming into this season, 133 over his last three seasons. He is a big-time scorer, but has only seven thus far through 28 games this year, and he's been snake bit. He has 25 shots on goal in his last four games coming into tonight. But no matter how good his chances have been, he hasn't been able to score figure it out. McCrory throws the shot on that that Perron easily sweeps away. Dubois steps up off the point and his shot blocked by Corrible. And maybe more importantly for Dubois, he avoided the check of Ike. And the puck off Corrible all the way back into the Manitoba zone. Now, I'll have to have somebody explain that one to me at a later date. Coincidental minors that do not affect the number of players on the, on the ice surface as the puck is deflected out of play. How come nobody on the ice seems more baffled than we are about this? I mean, they started out with, well, they've had longer to deal with it. We just now heard about it. <laughs> we, we watched, we watched it all. Ward and Allison each picking up 10 minute misconducts as well. There is no way though that he can be ruling that the slashing calls came after the altercation. They were the initial reason for the whistle and the stoppage of play. Uh, you and I will have to remain perplexed as the play continues at center ice. Whistle down with three and a half to go. And now perhaps a penalty call we'll be able to figure out. Well, no, it's just a puck played by a high stick, excuse me. As I, as I described, Crow comes off on this, this particular play, but Donnelly may have been whistled for the slash on Arneal. Arneal gets away scot-free and Riccardi comes in later the only thing that makes sense to me. I'll buy that. Okay. And now it is a high sticking penalty on Phil Crow. I bet you this results in a power play for Manitoba. You think this will affect <laughs> the uh, manpower situation on the ice? That's what I like about you when it comes to gambling, you're gutty. <laughs> the Moose with a much needed power play. Three and a half to go in the period if they harbor hopes of coming back in this one. Right now. A power play goal here would be very advantageous. Get it to the locker room, only down three, and really, despite being dominated this period, they would only be a goal further down than they were coming into it. So, everything being relative, that would be positive, but the Moose would have to score on this power play to get that 
particular situation. A minute and a half to go in Crow's penalty. Puck at center. Russ Romanuk loses the handle. It's gloved back in by Dubois, but Dirk able to clear. And Travis Thiessen back to get it. For Tolaire. And back to Thiessen, broken up at the line by Monjoba but trailing the play, Romanuk brings it in. High slot drop pass picked off by Bobby J. Tried to start a breakout, but Wilson picks it off and sends it back in. Parrott will just send it hard up the boards. It caroms right to Todd Simon. Simon carries it in. He already has a shorthanded goal this evening and now rags it all the way back to the line where Parrott will again pick his spot and golf at the length of the ice. 45 seconds left in the Manitoba power play. Snyder almost gave it away to Simon in the slot. He just didn't know where it was after knocking it down. Wilson ahead for Mike Stevens. Converged upon by Manjot and Bobby J. Got it across the line for Tolaire. Tries to shovel it back, went right through McCrory. And it's iced by Manjot. Brathwaite out to play it in the corner. Inside two to go in the second. Schneider will take it behind his own net. 15 seconds remains in the penalty to Crow. McCrory ahead at center. Weaving on the right side, plays it off the boards. Delayed offside is waved as Savaglia ices the puck. And the penalty to Crow winding down now, the final seconds, as he gets set to rejoin the play, and both teams are full strength. All fast after the Vipers game, clicking on all cylinders here in the second period. Truly over the poke check, there would have been a breakaway, but he didn't have his stick anymore. Brathwaite just covered it up. The Vipers will be home here at the Palace quite a bit in the upcoming weeks as well, including next Tuesday here against the Fort Wayne Comets, then on the 20th, It'll be the Kansas City Blades in Detroit. And on December 22nd, your last peak at the Vipers before the holiday, it's the Michigan K-Wings. You can get your tickets by calling 810-377-0100 or stopping by the Palace Box Office or any Ticketmaster locale. Dan Drulia has had an excellent game here. He's been relentless on the forecheck. So aggressive that he even lost his stick on that particular play. Putting the poke back in poke check. <laughs> Face off to the right of Fred Brathwaite. He spelled Vincent Riendo midway through the second period. Loader and Simon took it. Simon now with it on the near side, trying to spin away from Loader. Can't stick handle around him, so Samson off will come over and get it. Tries to come in front and stuff it in Brathwaite with the save. Boy, there's that great skating ability and the ability, I know it's a cliche, but to turn on a dime of Sergei Samson off. I think everybody in the building was convinced he was going behind the net with that puck, and the next thing you know, boom, he's right in front. So much to be impressed by with Sergei Samsonov. One of the things is his ability to make plays in traffic, in tight spaces. As you said, laterally, he can skate like few others. He's out there with Simon and Corbo right now. Face off again to the right of Brathway. Loader wins the draw again. Behind the net, Riccardi sends it ahead, and Tolaire backhands it off the dasher out of harm's way. Less than a minute to go, second period, as Simon feeds Samson off, and now back in the Detroit zone. Dirk feeds it up the wall. Picked off by Dubois, he fires it in, overcomes Shaw to knock that away and take it behind his own net. Ahead for Simon, nice little feather pass, finds Samson off, got it to the line, but broken up there. Chris Jensen in a little bit of trouble at his own blue line. Gave it to Dubois. He got the red line and flutters it into the Detroit. And Manitoba wants to finish a chain. Shaw finds the open ice. Still being bothered by Tolaire. Plays it away. 25 seconds to go. Second period. Sampson off from Dirk. Ahead now for Donnelly. Has a man with him. Fires it wide of the mark. Manjot was charging hard to the net. Tolaire comes back and backhands it all the way into the Detroit zone. Rich Parano has not been very busy here in the second period, plays it away. Errant pass misses Manjo. He tries to kick it into the zone. Five seconds now left in the period. Snyder knocked out of the play by Donald, and that'll do it. The second period has come to a close. The Vipers storm the Manitoba zone in the middle period, and now have a commanding four-goal lead as they head to the locker room after two periods of play coming up in our second intermission. A longtime veteran and Manitoba captain Randy Gillen will join us. And Jean Perron has to find some sort of tonic or some sort of reason for his club to get up for the third period of play. they got a pretty steep hill to climb. The Viper lead is four, Detroit five, Manitoba one after two at the Palace of Auburn Hill.
Back after this. Come on, we can get it. Dude, go for it. Are you crazy? <laughs> Santa is not going to like this. Right now, when you buy Pepsi, you can get $10 off Microsoft software. It's a steal. You can tell which house has the Vicks NyQuil and which doesn't. Bob and Fred both came home coughing, sneezing, <laughs> stuffy, aching all over. Bob's house had a cold medicine which only relieves his stuffiness and aching. While Fred's home had Vicks NyQuil. It relieves all his symptoms. It's coughing, sneezing, stuffiness, and aching. So unlike Bob, Fred gets the rest he needs. That's the restful plus of Vix NyQuil. It's the cold relief you want to come home to. Vix NyQuil. One Detroit has the lead over the Manitoba Moose after two periods of play at the Palace of Auburn Hills. John Hours alongside my broadcast partner, former Canadian Olympian, Darren Elliott. And Darren, the Vipers have had problems scoring goals of late. This is so often the way it goes. You go three, four games, you can't buy one, suddenly everything starts going in. Nobody knows better than Vince Riendo. Well, I think you talked about it. Feast or famine for the Vipers. Sometimes it's feast or famine for the goaltender. We talked about both Brathwaite and Riendo playing very well this season. Sometimes the, 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 the dam is going to break in the first year tonight for Riendo. Oftentimes goes unnoticed as well. Brathwaite came in mid midway through the period. Played outstanding, particularly in the first couple of minutes. Otherwise, this thing's worse than it is for Manitoba. Well, it's still a blowout, but it could have been an embarrassment. Yeah, the Vipers have had trouble scoring goals until tonight, but we're joined now by a gentleman who's had no problem scoring goals of late. Randy Gillen joins us downstairs, the center and captain of the Manitoba Moose. And uh, I know the guys were joking with you uh, before tonight's game, Randy, about you're usually out there to check all the scoring centers. Now they've got to send somebody to, to check you. It's been going in for you lately, hasn't it? Well, I've just been fortunate enough lately to, to have some breaks and uh, get some bounces around the net. I think... Uh, you know, the guys I'm playing with have created lots of chances lately. Uh, Greg Penkowitz and Scott Allison. And, uh, you know, they're both aggressive guys that uh, forecheck hard. And I've just been uh, fortunate to be in the right place at the right time and been able to uh, bury my chances. Randy, you've always been a hard worker, characterized as a good face-off man. I talked to John Perron before the game. He said when he was putting this team together, he wanted a team that works hard. Does that fit with you think what John Perron's put together here? Well, I, I don't think you'd know that by the, the results tonight. I think, uh, obviously, uh, the Vipers are outworking us, and, uh, and, and, the sh and the score shows that right now. But, uh, you know, that's the type of team we have. We don't have a lot of uh, superstars, so to speak, and, and offensive players. We have a team that has to try to go out there and play hard and grind it out and uh, have to try to play a defensive game and wait for our bounces. So that's definitely the type of team that he's tried to put together. And... Uh, you know, it would be nice to have some more offensive players, but, but we don't have that right now, and, and that's just the way we're going to have to win games. Randy, you talk about no superstars on this club. Uh, in building a team, especially an IHL team, coming to what had been an NHL city, one of the knocks early on against this club has been no marquee players, no superstars, but you are the marquee recognizable player for this franchise, at least thus far. Are you comfortable with that role? Well, I think, uh, you know, obviously it's a hard role. I, I've uh, never been a, a great offensive player or anything like that, as we talked about earlier. But, uh, you know, I was a player that played in Winnipeg for, for a few years, and I think it, it's something the fans maybe recognize. And uh, it's nice, and there's some pressure. But uh, as you said, we're, we're trying to build our team, and uh, those things are going to come. Uh, we have Russ Romanock, who's a Winnipeg guy and a Winnipeg uh, ex-Jet, too, who who was hurt at the beginning of the year, and, and, and that hurt us a little bit, and he's now come out and played some great hockey for us. And they've got a young kid, Sean Tolaire, who's also a local product, who's come in and played very well. So, you know, uh, at the start, I'd say maybe that was true, but I think that the play of those guys has really, uh, really taken some of the pressure off as far as the local, uh, the local status goes, and, and, and it's really helped that those guys have come. And, uh, you know, the one thing about our team, as you said, it, although it is transplanted from uh, Minnesota, it is basically an expansion team. We don't have a lot of the players that are left, and uh, 
it takes time to build a winning team, as everybody knows, and, uh, and uh, people are just going to have to bear with us. And as I said earlier, we're going to have to work hard, and, and that's the way we're going to have to win games. Randy, on a personal note, is it nice to have the opportunity to, you know, put the tail end of your career together, so to speak, in a market and in your hometown? Well, there's no question. I think uh, one of the things I said when I was traded to Winnipeg, uh, you know, three years ago or, or three and a half years ago was it was going to be nice to come home and, and hopefully finish my NHL career in, uh, in Winnipeg. And uh, as everybody knows, the, the franchise picked up and moved to Phoenix. And uh, it, it was probably going to be my last year at the NHL level. And, uh, you know, for the IHL team to kind of fall, uh, everything just fell into place. And it, it gave me a chance to, to play a few more years and play in my hometown and, and make a good living and do what, uh, what I love. And that, that's play hockey. And, uh, you know, the circumstances couldn't have, couldn't have fit in any better. Randy, you played in uh, Winnipeg, and obviously it was an NHL city. Now you play there as an IHL city. You guys just were in Quebec last night. You're playing them a lot this season. I know the IHL was hoping to be welcomed with open arms in Canada. Quebec seems to be drawing well. You guys are drawing well as well. But on the surface, maybe go a little bit deeper. Do you feel the IHL is being welcomed in Winnipeg? Well, I think, it's, I think it's tough right now. I think the one thing that Quebec has over Winnipeg is uh, Quebec had that year off to, uh, to let their wounds heal, so to speak. And... Uh, the people in Winnipeg, it's really been tough on them to, to come in and, uh, you know, they lose their NHL franchise, which is another story in itself, and, and then to have us come right in. And I think the comparisons have been, have been tough, and, and it's been the hardest pill to swallow, especially with, uh, you know, the news. They, they pick up a player like Roanoke and things like that, and they see the money being spent down in Phoenix that, uh, you know, for financial reasons uh, maybe couldn't be spent in Winnipeg. And, uh, you know, the, the pressure's been there on us, and uh, the one thing that the people in Winnipeg are is they're hockey fans, and uh, they're always going to come out and watch the hockey. We just have to give them a good product to come out and watch, and uh, we've had a disappointing start at home this year, and uh, we hope to turn that around and, and give them the, something to, to come out and watch, and uh, if we can be competitive and win hockey games, they're hockey fans, and they will come out. Randy, it's been our pleasure. All the best. Thank you very much. Randy Gillen, the captain and center of the Manitoba Moose joining us here in our second intermission where Detroit has a 5-1 lead. Back with more after this from the Palace. Kellogg Frost and Flicks has teamed up with Canadian Hockey to put a tiger on your team. If your team's involved in minor hockey, get your coach to call this number to join Tony's Team Tiger. Team signed up collect tokens to score great prizes. A team party at Burger King. Starter t-shirts, contact two CDs, or the grand prize. Brett Hall autograph Eastern Hockey Sticks. Get your coach to sign up your team, then collect tokens from Mark Boxes of... Kellogg's Frosted Flake Cereal for kids of all ages. They're great! You can be a part of a golden moment. Adidas and Foot Locker present Face Off in Geneva. Win a trip for two to Geneva, Switzerland and see Canada's best juniors go for a fifth consecutive world championship. You'll fly on Air Canada, Team Canada's official airline, and stay six nights at the luxurious Hotel Giron. Plus, tickets to the games, a ski day at Chamonix, France, and much more, including $700 in spending money. To enter, visit any participating Foot Locker location between November 18th and December 11th and fill out a ballot for your chance to face off in Geneva. TSN invites you to join the tour. Get out and experience the greens of the greatest golf courses around the world. Tune in each week for hot spots and exotic locales on Golf the World, Sunday, TSN. Get on the move this winter with the latest in the world of snowmobiles. We're in tune with the hottest equipment and accessories to make your winter action-packed. Tune in late Thursday for tips and talk on snow tracks right here on TSN. We've set aside plenty of ice time for some cool moves and hot numbers. TSN presents America's Choice Skate Debate and the Northwest Mutual Team Figure Skating Championship, Thursday, TSN. NFL Sizzle is headed your way Sunday. Go deep and go interactive as the Seahawks and the Jaguars get it on in Jacksonville. NFL excitement. Feel the power on TSN. A 5-1 lead for the Detroit Vipers over the Manitoba Moose after two periods of play at the Palace of Auburn Hills. John Ellers alongside Darren Elliott back with you. And time for us to now peruse our way around the International Hockey League, a light schedule around the rest of the league. So we go right to our IHL News and Notes segment. And it begins with this Friday's first ever IHL All-Star balloting beginning. The balloting will run between December the 13th and January the 26th for the up.
upcoming All-Star Game in Grand Rapids to be played on February the 18th. It's sponsored by the league's official hotel, Days Inn. And Darren, a new twist for the IHL. The fans get involved, a chance for them to pick at least the starters, and I think it should be interesting being the first time around. Oh, very interesting. A lot of anticipation here in Michigan. The brand new Van Andel Arena, Grand Rapids, has been a great expansion franchise. A lot of excitement surrounding this All-Star game. Six different Vipers appear on the IHL All-Star ballot. The Van Andel, in fact, has been sold out for all but one of Grand Rapids' home games thus far this season. Should be the norm come All-Star time, February the 18th. Time now to also give our kudos to the IHL Players of the Week. And this week, we go north of the border to Quebec, where Rafale forward Steve LaRouche wins the honor. Deservedly so. LaRouche, it's his second time winning Player of the Week honors. He led all scorers in the league with seven points, leading Quebec with 2-0 and one record last week. Then we go far south of the border for our goaltender of the week, Frederick Shabbat, who has been white hot, not just last week for the Houston Arrows. Uh, Houston now won seven in a row, in large part due to Frederick Shabbat's play. This is what they expected when they picked him up from Cincinnati in the offseason. And speaking of goaltending, our final note on IHL News and Notes on this Wednesday evening. Scoring in the IHL at an all-time low this season? Well, it could indeed be the case, at least if the first third of the season is any indication. You look at the numbers, scoring in the IHL year by year has been going down for four straight years, but as we look at it decade by decade, it is nearing an all-time low. The lowest has been in 40 years. Some people say, why is that? Great goaltending? Well, we've seen a little bit of shoddy goaltending here, just some great shooting here tonight wouldn't support this stat, but overall there's a lot of reasons other than just goaltending. And the 6.34 goals a game are combined between the two clubs. Many would say they're not calling the marginal calls anymore. There's a new no tag up rule involved as well. Also guys who are in the union will say it is the goaltending. We have to get a footnote in there. 16 goaltenders thus far in the IHL this season with the goals against of under three thus far this season. Darren, the all-time record for a season is just six. Can it continue? I don't know if it can continue, but it's the defensive style of play is one thing. Because of all the expansion, you have more goaltenders that have the opportunity to put those kind of numbers on the board. It's been terrific to watch this year, though, from the old uh, union standpoint. Yeah, so far this season, D is king in the IHL, and the Vipers hope to keep it king the final 20 minutes. Because if so, they should have no problem holding on to a four-goal lead over the Manitoba Moose. Back with more from the Palace of Auburn Hills, including the third period of playoff. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to TSN Sports Desk. I'm Brendan Connor. Glad you're along for the show. And let us open the show with the Calgary Flames in dire need of a win these days. We're taking on another struggling team on Thursday night. Winless in five and floundering around right now. Robert Reichel hadn't scored a goal forever, it seemed. And Theron Fleury just can't carry that team by himself. Couple that with the fact that the Flames have half a dozen regulars out of their lineup with injuries. And they were in trouble, and it explains the trouble. But the Flames' trip to L.A. could be the tonic. The Flames have done all right against the Kings this year. And the Kings are not very good this year. First period, Flames four checking. German Titov steals from Yakmanev. A wraparound is stopped, and Robert Reichel there to score his first in a while. one nothing Calgary. Later, Cale Hulse and Sean O'Donnell getting it on at the Great West Forum. O'Donnell gets the better of this one, frankly. Kings, when we pick up the action, sloppy again. Titov strips Yaroslav Modry, and Theron Fleury picks it up, walks in, and sees that top corner, wires it into the corner. 2 nothing. Flames. Late first, Kings break in. Philippe Boucher centers to Brad Smith. Redirection, good save by Dwayne Wallace. And 2 0 after one. Second period, again, Le shoots. Rebound hacked that by Corey Stillman, and he bangs it home on the short side. 3 0 Calgary. They go on to win this one by a final of 5 to 1. The goal by the Kings, the first against Calgary in over 189 minutes. Kings have not beaten the Flames at home since April 13th, 1994. Okay, let's go to the Oilers and the Lightning from Tampa. First period action, Andre Kovalenko with a good chance here. Backhands it toward the net. Mike Greer will be the trigger man eventually. The young Greer's third of the year makes it 1-0 Edmonton. Second period, the Lightning on the prowl. Chris Gratton slides it to Rob Zaminer. He's in alone, trying to control that puck, and eventually makes the move and goes six side on Cujo. Ties the score at one. A few minutes later, Marius Tchaikovsky, good chance there. But Ryan Smith eventually bangs it in, and the Oilers lead it 2-1. But the Lightning would tie this game. A goal by Roman Hammerler tied it up. And the game ended in a 2-2 tie. Curtis Joseph has now stopped 92 of 94 shots in the last two games. Lightning snapping a four-game home losing streak, though, and happy for the point. Well, how about the Hartford Whalers? They are leading their division. They beat Florida this week, and Thursday night, another good test. What promised to be another entertaining game as they were in Philly. 
where the Flyers were coming off a win over Florida and were unbeaten in five. So another two strong teams in the East. And Paul Maurice, a key factor in the Whalers' play. The Flyers draw first blood here. Sean Podine forces the turnover. Diving pass here to Joel Otto. The Pat Balloon, who scores, makes it one nothing Philadelphia. Both teams in a giving mood this holiday season, obviously. Peter Sobota cops it up. Nelson Emerson to Stephen Rice. Bang, and it's in. 1-1 after one. Second period. Flyers up by one. And another. They add. Jaguar can't handle the rebound. John LeClaire spins and fires. You know, that was a lucky goal. He just flew, threw it at the net. Got under Jaguar. 3-1. Whalers close, though. Body strewn in front of the net. Stu Grimson pokes it loose, and Paul Ranheim stuffs it home. 3-2 to score. Flyers keep pressing, though, and young Jaguar, the 19-year-old in net for Hartford, can't squeeze the puck. Almost knocked away. Almost knocked in, but knocked away by Nelson Emerson there. 3-2 Flyers, the final good game. Maybe not the right guy to start, young Jaguar, when Jason Mazzotti is playing some good goals for you in Hartford. But Hartford loses this one at Philly, 3-2. The Whalers' unbeaten streak snapped at 6. The Flyers, 5-2-1 and one since Lindros came back to the lineup. Okay, let's go to the Devils and the Bruins now. Steve Casper's Bruins hosting tonight, and that means trouble because they don't play well these days at the Fleet Center. Devils make it 2-0 on this goal by John McClain on the 2-on-1. He's got 10 on the year. Casper furious, trying to shake up his team. Doesn't work. Minutes later, Devils get the puck to Sean Chambers at the point. He blasts one through a crowd. Bill Ranford saw nothing. Heard the bulge in the twine, though. 3-0 Devils. But Boston fights back into it. Ted Donato fighting off the checker and going to the backhand to beat... Martin Brodeur, 3-2, Devils, Bruins close it. Second period, Jay Pandolfo ahead to Patrick Eliash. Was this kicked in, or was that the blade of the stick in front of the skate? They checked upstairs, they counted it. First goal for the kid, 4-2 Jersey. Third period, 6-4, Devils. John McClain alone in the slot to wire it upstairs on Ranford. 7-4, the final score here for New Jersey over Boston. The Devils' first win in Boston since March of 1994. John McClain, two goals and a helper for a three-point night goal. Ranford winless in his last four starts. Okay, let's go on to JLA, Joe, and that is Chris Osgood in that, of course, and he is two great straight shutouts. Boy, this one was a rough one early on. Look at Shanahan and Fulbert trading them. Great scrap. Shanahan may have lost his jersey, but he gained some respect right there. First period, 1-0 Hawks. Nice passing. Creighton to Suter to Kevin Miller. What a great pass that was. He burns his old club. 2-0 Hawks. But the Wings storm back. Big game. Tied at two. Just watch Lariana. What a great move. And the veteran splits the defense, gets the backhander up in the top corner. 3-2 wings. You want to see another good goal? Check this one out. Fedorov has a defenseman. Ciccone backing in, and he just zings it on the stick side. Beats Eddie Belfort. Beauty. 4-2 wings. Third period. Probert with a vicious elbow and cross-check on Aaron Ward. And that brings some of the Red Wings over, and then a war breaks out. And Enrico Ciccone got the left hand loose and gives it to Jamie Pusher and gives him another one on the ice, too. We have to hear about that one a little bit later from the NHL Discipline Committee. But the final score here, Chicago loses at Detroit. The Red Wings with six unanswered goals. And the Red Wings have outshot opponents 168-77 to in the last four games. They're getting a lot of shots on net. Okay, other hockey news. Grant Fuhrer has signed a two-year, $4 million contract extension to stay on with St. Louis. And boy, does he deserve it. After some down years with Toronto, Buffalo, and L.A., he bounced back nicely last year. Signed with the Blues as a free agent. Played 79 of their 82 games. 34 years old in his 15th year in the NHL. Well, John Paddock is out, as you know. Bob Smith is in charge now with Phoenix. Coyotes making that move on Wednesday. Thursday, Bobby Smith, who's in charge of hockey operations and now is general manager as well, explained the rationale behind the move by the Coyotes. I think we had uh, an organizational structure that really was doomed for failure right from the beginning. And I thought it could work. And I thought with a uh, general manager and executive vice president, uh, even though there was really one job being done by two people, that we could do it successfully. It was, it was perception from the outside, but it was also inside. There was, uh, you know, a lot of double messages and, uh, you know, a lack of clarity and some ambiguity as to what the message was from management. And I think now there's going to be one clear message. Still with Hockey News, the NHL Board of Governors meeting in Phoenix this week. Thursday, they talked about realignment and the possibility of moving some teams around in the NHL. Many divisions, it turns out, would like the Toronto Maple Leafs, as they are a great draw on the road. Toronto, for its part, would like to be in the East, where they can rekindle their rivalry with the Montreal Canadiens. The Commissioner, Gary Bettman, says he's not sure what to do. They'll talk about it some more. And speaking of Toronto, they have signed... Defenseman Tom Peterson to a two-way contract. Peterson starting the season in Japan this year. Played 60 games for the San Jose Sharks last year. Not offered a contract for this season. 
Peterson's best year in the NHL came in 93-94, scoring 25 points in 74 games. And the New York Rangers have loaned forward Christian Dubé to Canada's national junior team. Dubé has played in 23 games this season. He has a goal and an assist. Dubé was on Canada's junior squad last year, the one that captured a goal in Massachusetts. And speaking of the World Juniors, a reminder, training camp for our national junior team gets underway Friday in Kitchener, Ontario, and we'll have daily coverage training camp reports here on TSN Sports Desk. All right, let's take a break now. When we come back, a whole pack of Grizzlies can't stop the Trailblazers in Portland. He's highlight of the night on this edition of TSN Sports Desk. And for this one, we head to Detroit for the Hawks and the Wings. Check out this great goal by Igor Larionov. Picks it up center ice, makes his move over the blue line, and then backhander upstairs. Great one-on-one -on -one move by a great veteran, Igor Larionov. Picks it up in the neutral zone. Scoots over the blue line, makes his move to freeze the defender, and then the backhander for the highlight of the night. And Detroit won that game 6-2 over Chicago. Six unanswered goals. Elsewhere, the Flames won. They gave the Canucks a bucket full of points against the Blues, while the Oilers try to be slick against the Panthers. The Grizzlies hope the sun doesn't come up in Phoenix. John Wetland may be home on the range. And some NFL teams in their quest for a playoff berth is picked off. Canada keeps its quest towards the World Cup. Pay attention. Sports Desk is next. Yeah, pay attention. Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm Rod Smith. Paul Coffey got an early Christmas present on Sunday in the form of a one-way ticket out of Connecticut. It was just over two months ago that uh, Coffey was dealt to Hartford in the Brendan Shanahan deal. At first, he refused to go and then did so with the understanding he wouldn't be there for long. He was not. Coffey traded to Philadelphia Sunday along with a third-round draft choice in next year's draft. And in return, the Whalers get defenseman Kevin Holler and Philly's first-rounder and seventh-round pick in 97. I was hoping it was going to be here. There's uh, no doubt about that, but I didn't really find out till this afternoon. Uh, there have been talk the last couple of weeks, uh, rumors that it could possibly be Philadelphia, but uh, it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster until it happened. I just tried to not to get my hopes too high. I like everything, to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't think you can win as many Stanley Cups and uh, as many individual awards and. Uh, things like Paul Coffey has done without being a great player and, and being a great team player. I think any time you get a chance to be involved in a, an organization like the Flyers with the tradition they have, uh, the championships in the 70s, uh, the quality people that, that run this organization, I mean, I, you know, I've been pretty lucky in my 17 years in the league. I played with great players and been involved in some great organizations. And for me, to hopefully end it here as a Flyer is a, it's a real thrill. Okay, let's head off to Philly and Boston playing. Coffee in attendance, but of course didn't arrive in time to play. Just does a bit of talking. First period, Troy Millette going low on Daniel Lacroix. Lacroix responds this way. Doesn't like it much, so nice and dirty. And he starts to pay for it as well as uh, Millette pops him once or twice. Probably shouldn't have retaliated. Flyers get on the board first. Pat Falloon, a nice centering pass to Sean Podine, who beats Bill Ranford 1-0 Philly. 2-0 in the second. A mistake by Ranford. Gives it away. And uh, Rod Brindamore, first Ranford robbed him, but then can't stop the rebound. 3-0 for the Flyers. Third period, Flyers put it away. Brindamore feeding Carl Dykhouse the blast. The goal, 4-0 Philly. Ron Hextall would stop 28 shots for the shutout. And Philadelphia, on the day they get coffee, they don't really need them. 6-0 in that one. Hextall, 28 saves. And that's back-to-back -back shutouts for the Flyers. First time they've done that since beating Toronto and Hartford back in uh, March the 23rd and again on the 25th. By now, I'm sure Vancouver's Russian connection has grown tired of hearing how it hadn't been scoring enough lately. Sunday at the Kiel Center in St. Louis, Pavel Bure and Alexander McGillney responded. Responded big time. Tom Rennie wants to play the defense Tom Rennie. inside. You know, Canucks have had trouble when these guys are not scoring, and here they go. Pavel Bure sending it in for McGillney. one nothing for the Canucks. One of many later in the first. Esatikin for McGillney. There's number two. 2 nothing. Vancouver, second period. A little familiar, McGillney, Bure, Tikkanen. There's the hat trick for McGillney. 4 nothing. Vancouver pouring it on. Grant Fuhr getting simply pounded in this one. But Mike Keenan keeps him in for a little more abuse here. He receives uh, it from Tikkanen, centering for Bure. Bure converts. 7 nothing. Canucks after two. It's been a while since we've had to say Bure and McGillney so many times late in the third. Blues looking to break the shutout. Perjah from the slot. Corey Hurst stands his ground and gets the shutout. Worst shutout in uh, Blues history, tying a record set about 20 years ago. Hirsch, 42 
shot he faced, second shutout of the season. And by the way, Gino Wojcik scored his first goal of the season. Let's move on now to the Panthers and the Oilers in Florida. Curtis Joseph looking for their first ever win, believe it or not, against the Panthers. Not off to a good start. Already down one nothing. Robert Vela, nice pass to Scott Mellonby. Beats Joseph from the slot, 2-0. Panthers still in the first. Joseph cops it up. Radic Dvorak wide open. Three goals and five shots, and Joseph is gone. Oilers come back, though, trailing 3-1. Mike Greer, great effort avoiding Ed Jovanovski and beating John Van Beesbrook to make it 3-2. And then, 2-on-1, Doug Waite, Marius Turkoski, the one-timer. Three shots, three straight goals. Game's tied at three. What a comeback. But late in the first, Todd Marchand. Could be bad news there for Edmonton. Goes to the boards awkwardly and uh, jams his right ankle. Had to leave the game. And here is where it is put away. Bill Lindsay on the rebound to beat Bob Essence. Uh, 4-3 for uh, the Panthers. And they had a couple of more. Win it 6-3. to three. Tied a season high with six goals. And Edmonton's futility continues. The Panthers lead the all-time series now. Four wins, no losses, and one tie. Florida takes it. Leafs and the Red Wings at Joe Louis Arena. Trouble for Mike Murphy. All those injuries. Ten players who have played in the minors this season. Felix Potvin, of course, not one of them, but they need a big game from him. He struggled Saturday against Phoenix. Looking good in the first. Great stop on Martin Lapointe. Keep the Leafs alive. He was sprayed with 24 shots in the first. They solve him here. Brendan Shanahan pops it in. one nothing for Detroit. They're up 2 nothing. The Wings will capitalize shorthanded. Sergei Fedorov, no mistake. Three nothing Detroit. What do you do if you're Mike Murphy? The slow boil will do, I guess. Leafs get on the board late in the period. Jamie Heward, the pass to Sergei Berezin. Nice shot, but not enough for Toronto. The losing ways would continue. Yeah, the Leafs fall flat again in Motown. 3-1, the final score there. Wings unbeaten in five. The Leafs three and 12 on the road. They've lost three straight. They've lost 12 of the last 16 games overall. To Ottawa now. Canada specifically. Stars and the Senators. Ottawa hasn't won at home in a month. First period. Joe Newendike alone in front. Ron Tugna is there for the save. Later in the period. Grant Ledyard shot. Stop. Jamie Langenbrunner with the rebound. On the backhand. one nothing after one. Second period. Send power play. Not much power in it though. It's Dallas. Mike Medano breaking in shorthanded. Look at the move. No problem. Beautiful they goal. Again, Stops on, on a dime. This is the same power play, and Dallas will score again. Richard Matvichuk. Not a memorable power play if you're a Senators fan. Beating Ron Tugnut. Both the uh, Sens and their fans are falling asleep. Can hardly blame them. Still second. Benoit Hogue down low to Neuendijk. Beats Damian Rhodes in there. 4 nothing for the Stars. Andy Moog faced uh, 23 shots. Not too bad. Not really challenging shots, though. And he gets the shutout. Maybe one of the easier shutouts he's ever uh, come up with. The Sens falling to 1-6-1 and one in their last eight games overall. Also, Pittsburgh finally lost. Penguins beaten in Chicago. Their 11-game unbeaten streak, six-game winning streak, is now come to an end. Bad news, though, for the Colorado Avalanche. Their leading scorer, Peter Forsberg, left Saturday night's game after Todd Simpson landed a knee-to-knee -knee hit. This looked pretty scary. Simpson received a major for it. Forsberg limped from the ice and did not come back. He has a bruised left thigh and is listed as very doubtful for uh, the next couple of games. He will be re-examined later this week. The basketball now in the NBA. The Vancouver Grizzlies coming off that win over Orlando on Friday, looking to make it two straight Sunday. Well, his brother is the fourth highest paid player in the league behind Mario Lemieux, Gretzky, and Messier. So if uh, Valerie does pop in the goals like they think he can, it won't be long before he probably gets up there. And the family paycheck grew quite a bit over the summer. He married TV star Candace Cameron from the uh, TV show Full House. So here's Recky, caught from behind by Grattan. And it slowed him up enough to force it offside. They were stupid.
you think you're feeling a little woozy right now? How about these guys? Low blows, and down goes Bo again. Yeah, this hit. Don't worry, you can look now. Check out these great moves from the hard court. David leaves it for the game. Nothing quite like action on the ice. Not that kind of action. Ledyard shoots, kick, save, X call, rebound for B. Save, X call, rebound in front. And they somehow clear it out of there. Here he comes with Letton and a two on one short end. And McDonald's in a fake, the shot. He scores! Went Convery. And it's thrown off a pass and an end. Yeah, that goal stinks. But sometimes you just can't understand what an athlete is thinking. Rob, you just come down the course. What's it look like up there? Was that until next week we're itching to get out of here more of that sort of stuff time now for the corral the highlight of the night and for this one we'll go back to the molson center the canadians against tampa bay and watch john cullen pick it out of midair and that puck had some velocity on it goes in and beats jocelyn tebow take a look at it at least one more time we always give you a couple of different looks at the highlight of the night out of the air he knocks it out spins around goes up high on jocelyn tebow great hand-eye coordination for that guy john cullen one more time knocks it down spins around goes in for the corral highlight of the night played their best game of the year saturday night whipping the colorado avalanche four to one but to make that game really count the flames had to use it to build on which they hope to do monday night against the New Jersey Devils. This is a Devils team that's playing really well. Jacques Lemaire has them quietly moving up in the standings. First period, Bob Carpenter, new twist on defense, fires. German Titov sticking to the stands. No stick, no score. Security comes in, says, uh, this guy says, I'm not giving the stick back, and congratulations on winning the Masters. Second period, were those bad jackets or what? Brian Rolston on Dwayne Rolison, and he scores to make it 1 0. Rolston beats Rolison, they're rolling. Later on, Steve Sullivan finds Rolston again, watch the quick move right here, and it's 2 0 for the Devils, and they keep piling it on. The Devils all of a sudden have found their offense. Dave Andrichuk with the feet of Bobby Holik, and Holik will score to make it a 3 nothing game, and uh, that was more than enough for Mike Dunham. Who? Mike Dunham. He did it. He done it. Who did it? Dunham with a save. Fourth shutout of the year for the New Jersey Devils, and it doesn't get much easier than that. He had a very easy time, and the Devils made it look very easy against the Calgary Flames. Devils four-game on beaten streak now, and their first win in Calgary since November 1991. The explosive Canadian offense has fallen silent. Injuries are a big part of it, but in Montreal, injuries are excuses, and they don't wash. Habs were home to a very hot Tampa team, and Montreal had not scored more than three goals in any of their past eight games. Saku, where are you? And three in this one may have done it. It was that close a game. A Terry Crisp and the Lightning John playing their best hockey of the year on beaten in four. Second period. John Collins, you believe that? Picked it out of the air. That was a bullet that he knocked down and then made a nice move on Jocelyn Tebow. One nothing at that point for Champa. Hans come right back. Stefan Kintel cutting in. This is a nifty play by Kintel. Outweights Tabaracci and it's a 1-1 game. Third period now. Vincent Domfus goes in all alone. One-on-one -on -one with Tabaracci and Tabaracci makes the save. I don't know how he did it. I think it hit him right in the butt. It's still tied. A few minutes later, Chris Gratton fights off Murray Barron. Chris Grant looking to plow his way through, and he beats Tebow on the backhander. Not a real pretty goal, and it is a 2-1 to one lightning lead, but Montreal comes right back. Stefan Reche, not much room on the short side here. Tabaraji just gives him a little look, and he takes it. It's tied at two. But a short time later, Habs in the power play. Zander outworks a couple of Canadians to Mikhail Anderson. The good shot, but Tebow probably should have had it. 3-2 for the Lightning. They scored an empty netter to win it 4-2, so that third goal would have made a big, big difference. The Lightning now unbeaten in their last five games, and as for the Canadians, they are struggling without Saku Koivu. They are winless in their last three without him. Next up, the Whalers visiting the New York Rangers. Hartford trying to avoid losing three straight for the first time this season. First period, Pat Flatley centers for 
Uh, it looks like him, but could that be Bill Berg? Yeah, that's Bill Berg. He's on a tear right now. Beats Jason Musati, one nothing at that point. A few minutes later, Wayne Gretzky behind the net. When he gets it there, you're dead. It's just a matter of how. Gets it to uh, Luke Robitaille, who sweeps it through. It sits on the line, and it's a 2 nothing game. Rangers then shorthand. Watch the play by Messi. Great feed to Graves, and he unloads in a hurry. 3 nothing. still in the first. Jason Musati pulled from the game, not a happy man. Zuger goes in, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather be Musati on the bench on this night. Second period, Doug Lister takes the shot. Watch where it goes here. It sits behind Zuger. Burt then flips it in front, and it's knocked in by Lister. 4 0 at that point for New York. Third period, now newly acquired Kevin Haller. And Wayne Gretzky takes the wild swipe at him. He misses, but this guy doesn't. Oh, oh, oh. Stu Grimson just nails Shane Churla just back from a broken orbital bone, and the teammates finally come in and say, stop the beating. I mean, that was as hard a shot as you can give a guy. A right hook right on the button. That looked like uh, the fight from Saturday night. Wicked shot. 5-2. The Rangers over Hartford. Whalers season high three game losing streak. And the Rangers one game over 500 for the first time this season. Pistons owned the Raptors last year when they weren't much of a team. Beat them four straight, in fact. So you really couldn't be too off. Chris Osgood, the number one netminder in the National Hockey League, was not even dressed tonight. Kevin Hodson is the backup netminder for Detroit in this game. Fedorov coming over to get it. Fedorov, Konstantinov, back on D with Petisov. As that Soviet unit may get a chance to be together tonight. They are not right now because Greg Johnson is out there with Larianov and Fedorov up front. Flip back into the corner by Patrick Law. Fedorov tried to center, came back up to the point. Jumped back out of the zone. Eric Lacroix cleared back on the near side. Petisov over to get it. Back to Fedorov. Fedorov was in the zone too soon, and that will draw the whistle. Kerry Fraser is our referee down the court. John Moran are the linesman tonight. And even without Peter Forsberg, if there's one man in this Colorado lineup that's capable of stealing a point or two from even the Detroit Red Wings, you all know it's Patrick Waugh. He has been terrific for the Lions this season. They have lost three out of the last four. Talk to people that are around this team all the time. They say, not because of this man. He is still terrific. He has had a great year because this team, get, uh, Colorado, did not get off to a particularly hot start offensively as this season. He came in so fast. Who was that that came in? Bob Airy? Bob Airy. Not known as a fighter, particularly. No, but, but, but he, he came over that time. You know what, Gary? He's one of the guys that's in the last year of his contract. He's been in and out of the lineup. And Scotty Bowman has a rotation of about a half dozen guys Three or four of which play, and the other two guys kind of sit. Bob Airy's in that rotation. He doesn't want to be in it. He wants to play regularly. Sylvain Lefebvre started it with one of the Red Wings. It was Shepard, or at least Johnson. Bob Airy to the rescue. Sack and Peter Forsberg. I don't want to put any coal in the Christmas stocking here. Both guys free agents at the end of the year. And you want to talk about leverage? Both have the same agent. Boston could be in the free agent market also. Look for about six million per. Can they afford it? Will they trade one? Will they go as free agents? That's the question they're going to face. No two guys so set to rob a bank in the West since Butch and Sunday. <laughs> and there's Sackick trying to move it in. Hope checked away. Joe Sackick coming into this game among the leagues of leading scorers. Tied for sixth in that department. There you see the penalty killing and power play numbers as uh, Airy went off on the roughing uh, call. He got a double minor and LaFave got the two. So that creates the power play opportunity and the first of the game. It'll be played here at center by Huey Krupp. Drop pass goes to the wide side. Detroit penalty killers out there. Psychic knocks it back the other way. Avalanche have been led by Scott Young. Six power play goals. Forsberg four. Jeff Psychic has five. Forsberg, of course, is out of this game. Psychic had it jumped over the stick near side. Krupp tried to hold it in along the boards. Good play by Taylor to get it out of there. And that will be whistled here. And these two teams who do not like one another and have started that way here in this first period. Four and a half minutes in. This will be the second scrum we have already had. Merry Christmas, Steve Levy. And the same to you, Gary. The new Dodge taking us shopping in the mall. A minute 17 after the Whalers are tied at 1-1 with the Blues. Curtis' decision pass kind of picked off. And Al McKinnis, man, he can still shoot the puck. The Blues a 2-1 lead. And, of course, Paul Coffey, the deal that was talked about for months, literally, has now made it to Philadelphia. And uh, Kevin Haller went the other way. Flyers power play needed a quarterback on the blue line. They have now the premier power play quarterback in the NHL in Paul Coffey. LaFave setting it up for Colorado. The double minor forced LaPointe to go in there with Bob Airy. You've got the double minor. 
So the power play opportunity underway here for the Colorado Avalanche. They are into it already. Colorado with a minute two left on this advantage. Colorado went three for six against Detroit in the first game on the power play. 4-1 victory in that game that came on November 13th, the game we broadcast from Detroit. The Avalanche just dominated the Red Wings in that game. They sure did. They were clearly the better team. Clearly the better team. And I still think personnel-wise, Mark Crawford's team, there is Mark behind the bench. I still think personnel-wise that Colorado has the better team. Detroit, with or without Peter Forsberg, with the Lanch having Forsberg or not having him, are playing better and may be a better team right now at this stage of the hockey season. That may very well be. The Colorado Avalanche playing 500 hockey in their last 10 games. Sackett dropped it back for Young. Power play for the Avalanche underway. Young with Fedorov on him. Great job by Fedorov on the forecheck shorthanded. Third back out the center. Dead March is open. Adam Dead March and alone. Save made by Vernon. It's sent to the goal line. Tipped by Sackick and covered by Vernon. What a play by Mike Vernon. He made the initial save. The puck was free right at the goal line. Sackick reached in, tried to tip it, and Vernon dove back. Couple of big saves early. Big confidence builder right there for he, for Mike Vernon and his teammates. Big. A good little dump pass to Adam Dedmarsh, who was doubtful for this game. We didn't expect Adam Dedmarsh to be able to answer the bell and play this game. He also was suffering from a Charlie horse, as is Peter Forsberg. Made a nice move, but Vernon just outweighed him. And then you would expect Mike Ricci to go driving the net for whatever he can find lying around as garbage. That's Ricci's game. Oh, look at that. That doesn't hit the handle of his stick. Well, he had a defenseman back there trying to help. Good save by Mike Vernon. He just outweighed Adam Deadmarsh, but Deadmarsh made his move. Vernon kicked over to the side. Deadmarsh, four goals in the last ten games for the right winger, who is questionable, as Bill said, about playing tonight. Brent Severin there. Penalty minute leader is a scratch tonight. Stefan Yell's got a hip flexor. He's out. Eric Messier, just called up yesterday, is also out of Denmark. A power play goal. One nothing Avalanche. He ain't gonna stop me two times in a row. Man, did Adam Denmark pull the trigger on that one? Now I, I don't even know if Sanders Ozolins was trying to pass to Denmark. He had two options when he was cutting in. The Red Wings got caught out of position. They, they needed to be back. Here it is. See two Red Wings. They double covered over on the boards. Pass over to Ozilich. And it looked like his pass back flipped off his stick. I think he was passing back to Mike Ricci, but it went right to Dead Marsh and bang. Mike Vernon didn't even have a chance to react. one nothing Colorado. So the Colorado Avalanche are now four for seven against Detroit on the power play this season. And Adam Dead Marsh. Second chance. That was the golden one. And a one nothing lead. Detroit now back at full strength. And the Red Wings centering by McCarty. Good pass on the far side to Steve Eiserman who had to bounce off and over his stick. Question about the ice here tonight. The ice show has been in town recently. They soften the ice. Sackick the other way. Sackick. Center. What a save made by Vernon. As Kaminsky was open. And Vernon cut across and knocked it down. Two good chances on an odd man rush again right there as Colorado getting the early opportunities and good ones. Steve Eiserman took it in the corner, played back behind the net, the goal at 5.23. Deadmarsh gets his ninth from Ozilinch and Young. Random Deadmarsh, five of the nine goals he has have been on the power play this season. Konstantinov cleared it up, taken back at center. They'll read right there. Gusarov went back to help out. Greg Johnson on the near side pays for it up against the boards as he got hit by Keane. Knocked away to Fedorov. Fedorov sent it through the middle by Larianov. Played up by Patrick Wan out of the zone. Detroit will have to get back on side. You know, these odd man rushes should not be happening. The Detroit Red Wings have the best defensive team numbers-wise in the NHL. The best penalty-killing unit. They double come in the penalty-killing unit. They gave up the two on one even point. And you saw Larianov haul his man down there. No penalty call. Fans didn't like it. Konstantinov puts a hit on the far side. That'll free the puck up to Batisov back in the middle. Fedorov tips it in. No icing here. Brown will play at the foot behind the net. Foot got tied up, taken away by Fedorov. Fedorov has come out like a house of fire here in this game. He is really playing it both ways on the ice. And Fedorov's been out doing some double shifting work early on in this game. 
Puck loose at center. Fedorov got spun around. Avalanche back. Detroit was changing. Shot by Miller. Saved by Vernon. And he will hang on. Great to have you with us. National Hockey Night here in a cold and snowy Denver. We're cuddled up one nothing right now. Can MasterCard predict the future? Whoop. Wide open behind him was Joe Sackick. Dandano is on the on the real steep learning curve right now. He came into the pros as a winger and is being converted. 24 wins, fourth most points at home. They jam up behind the net. Mike Ricci was back there at a foot at the point. Put the shot deflected wide through the screen by Ricci. Hit on the far side of the point. Kostrov held it in. Konstantinov just left it in behind the net. Troy trying to work it back through the middle. Fedorov. He has really got the burners on in this game. Pass intended for Taylor, intercepted. Fetisov gets it back. Slava Fetisov to Fedorov. He's got Taylor with him. Puck rolls ahead. Fedorov shot right through the crease, but not on Patrick Waugh. Fetisov holds it in the dash here. Behind the net, Fedorov tried to center. Keane intercepted. Keane does the bumping of the far side with Martin LaPointe. Comes away to Keane finally. Keane looking out through the middle of Young. Back of the attack, Scott Young. Just one goal in 13 games for Young, who dumps that one back in, and Detroit will get it behind the net as the Avalanche change it up. Batisov's pass intercepted. Break right here for the Avalanche. Back is Keith Jones. Jones pinned up. Sackett comes back to help out. Sackett, Jones kicking away for Colorado. Read the puck up to Kaminsky. Centering pass. Hit Mike Vernon. He knocked it away. Jones was open, but Vernon blocked it. Cleared up, not out. Keith Jones kicks it in again. Dandino's going to come back to get it behind the net. Dandino starts it up. Detroit trying to come through the middle early in this game. They've got a three on two momentarily. Lost it. Save made by Rob. Rebound. Wow, the save on Dandino. Back to the point. Wide open. Lindstrom shot. Here's the lead. Batisov reaching out. Able to control it enough so Larianov could help out here. Detroit led by Steve Eisenman's 38 points and Brendan Shanahan's 17 goals. They've been the big two for the Red Wings. Sent back in way outside. Konstantinov and Corbet were tied up inside the zone. And that faceoff comes all the way back down to Colorado's zone. Want to remind you, coming up on the Deuce tomorrow night at 7.30, the Los Angeles Kings and Ray Ferraro will be taking on the former King, now leading scorer, New York Ranger, Wayne Gretzky. 7.30 tomorrow night, Eastern Time, on the Deuce, the Kings and the Rangers. You see the numbers that he put up as a King, Wayne Gretzky, and since joining the New York Rangers. Not that far off. Vladdy Konstantinov, he is a target every time he is on the ice. But if you don't have the bullseye on his back or on his chest, you know that he's going to take you, so you might as well try to get him first. That's Rene Corbet, one of the centers who's going to get some playing time. Right off the face-off, shot to flex off the shoulder of Patrick Waugh, up and over the net. Patrick Waugh, 328 wins, 10th all-time in that department. He is fifth in goals against and first in wins this year with 17. Coming at us, coming at goal camp, right off the face-off. Not much to shoot at. You, I mean, you, you couldn't even see any daylight on the short side. Patrick Watt takes the short side away virtually all the time. Third back up to Young on the near side. Young will send that one out of the zone. Avalanche up by one and with the puck reaching on the crowd. Doing battle with Batista. Puck rolls against the wall in that corner. Trying to get it back out to the point is Keane. Keane, Ricci doing battle. Ricci deflected it. Then it bounced off. Ricci to the near side. Greg Johnson pinned up by Young. Ricci drops it off again to Keane. Mike Keane back to the point. Shot there by Foot. Turning out in front. Larianov plays it out of there. Fedorov drops it wide side. Back to Fedorov. Trying to move it in. Poke checked away at center. Fetisov up. Fedorov down the right wing side. Fedorov takes the hop step. Gets to the circle. And goes the other way with it. Centering pass deflected over Patrick Wise's head. I don't think I've seen Sergei Fedorov play with this abandon for a long time. No, and now he's getting something for it, Gary, with his goals in five of the last six games. I mean, he's been coming on, but he just hasn't been able to put up any numbers. Now he is. Fedorov, six goals, ten games. He gets control of it while they regroup. Young had it tipped away at center. Right back in Johnson for Fetisov, who is cutting. Johnson will have to play it back. Doug Brown out of the game tonight, and Vyacheslav Kozlov, also a scratch for the Red Wings. Greg Johnson turns it into the middle for Fedorov. Big group of folks there, and cleared back out by Ozil, uh, Ricci. Back comes Matisov with it. He dumps it off the wide side boards. Konstantinov stepped up. Guzerov was there to knock it away from him. Young moving it back in the blue liner. Turn it, a hard shot on the ice by Young. Ricci. 
to go for a ride there as he was all over the back of the tee soft, but he avoided the penalty. Cleared back the other way. Icing call coming here. National Hockey Night from Denver. First period. Dead march to go. 523. Power play from Puzzlech and Young. Outside is right. But in here, so we like to take it. This is Aspen. About three hours from here. A great ski area. They did get a lot of snow here, about eight inches yesterday and last night. So that their bench is actually further to the boards. Here's Colorado's bench. You come over here, look how much closer Detroit's bench is to the board. Why does that matter? Scotty Bowman says it affects the whole game. When you're on that bench, getting your line changes done is extremely difficult. Said it's not fair, Al Morgani. About everything here in Colorado. Scotty Bowman basically saying, hey, what happens here? Does the Rocky Mountains block the directives from the league to get things fixed? He said literally, if they come here for the playoffs on that bench there and it's not fixed, I think he's going to show up with a hacksaw and fix it himself. He's also complaining about no clock in the locker room. Basically made it sound like, you know, it's a dog and pony show here. Let's get this thing fixed. My question is, what's so hard about fixing the bench? Somebody call Gary Bett, one of Brian Burke, and say, hey, they either fix the bench or they go play on the other one. It's not a hard problem. Fix it. At least they'll keep Scotty happy. He's won enough games. He deserves one on the house. Hey, dog and pony show or not, <laughs> the Stanley Cup does reside here, at least for the time being, in Colorado. You know, Pierre Lacroix, knew that Scotty was talking, Gary, to both you and Alan. Well, Pierre, he made it very obvious. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, and Pierre said to me, he said, you know, here, Scotty's got you guys doing something on the bench. First of all, he gained back November 27th, two goals in the past 18 games with the injury, of course, in there, and how much time he'll get tonight, Mark Crawford, his coach, said, we'll see. I want to play him as much as I can. Ian Young are the two players this time with Peter Forsberg, who is out of the game tonight. Flipped up over the glass, and that will get a whistle. We are down to a minute 53 here in the period. I want to remind you of the National Football League on ESPN Sunday night. The 10th. 12 yards is what he needs for 45,000 yards. And it'll be cleared out of there. He won't play much more than is necessary to get the numbers as they obviously want to keep him fresh now that they're already guaranteed the playoffs. But he could do that Sunday night. Drop back into the zone. Katisa starts it the other way. I have seen a lot of football crazy cities, but I don't think I have ever seen anything like this city. They, I'm telling you, they start next Sunday's broadcast as soon as the last Sunday's game is over. Yeah. I mean, it's un and it never ends. The pregame show starts Monday morning. Monday morning at least, if not Sunday night. In the corner, jammed away by Keane. Uh, dumped behind the net by Larianov. Red Wings work it up on the near side to Konstantinov. Goes to the middle. Greg Johnson. Johnson to Fedorov. Fedorov on the right side here in the wing. Fedorov looking in the middle, waiting for help. D was cutting, just rolls through on Patrick Waugh. Jamie Pusher started in and then turned around before he realized the pass was going to be coming to him. Minute two left to go here in the period. Talked about the injured Colorado players. Some big names. Peter Forsberg, obviously huge. Claude Lemieux, he won't be back probably for another month. And Stefan Yell is only expected to be out for a couple of games. But with Yell out, a terrific penalty killer. With Forsberg out, a power play guy. Joe Sackick, you're always guaranteed at least a chance of winning. I don't care who you're playing against. As long as you still have Joe Sackick in the lineup. Sackick will take some of that Peter Forsberg time tonight. 23. There you have it. Avalanche 1, Red Wings nothing. Steve Levy. All right, Gary and Bill, thanks very much. We will see you shortly. Somewhat of a surprise. Are you surprised that it's uh, Mike Vernon in goal and not Chris Osgood? Yeah, I am surprised because this is a big game for Detroit. They want to win it to show Colorado they can beat them in case they meet in the playoffs. Vernon's a great goaltender. I think maybe they're showcasing him a little bit in case they have to trade him at the deadline and get something for him. All right, one nothing. The Avalanche leading the Red Wings after one. Coming up on the new Dodge Intermission Report, there's more from Barry, Al Jordan, the Almighty Minute, fours and highlights. Brett Hall the Blues figured to be in a nasty mood against now happy Hartford and the Pens in a Mario mismatch. They are happy Hartford. That all the Whalers are happy to be in Hartford finally with the Paul Coffey trade. There's no way they could have possibly gotten equal value for, uh, for coffee. They get Kevin Holler and a pair of picks back. Well, there, there is equal value, Steve, because there's two teams with certainly different needs. Uh, Philadelphia has to win the Stanley Cup. That's the only way they'll be successful. Uh, Hartford's looking to get better with young players, so they got the young player and the pick. So it's a good deal for both teams. All right, fair enough. Kevin Holler, second game as a Whaler tonight at home against the Blues. Pierre Turgeon, the shot, the save, and Joe Murphy there, wide open for the rebound. One-nothing Blues. So then Keith Primo and Jim Campbell get into it. Nelson Emerson involved as well. 
Campbell picked up a five-minute major in a game misconduct for a spear, he would be gone. The top rookie scorer in the NHL. 1-1 in the second period. Al McKinnis comes up with a steal. And McKinnis can still shoot the puck. Man, it's 2-1 Blues at that point. 2-1 less than a minute left in the second off the Curtis decision shot. Steven Rice tips it home by John Casey. Grant Fear did not make the trip. 2-2 two -two tie. Then two on one. Brett Hall, Pierre Turgeon. And that's the way it's done. 3-2 St. Louis. And Steven Rice has just scored his second of the game, making it a 3-3 hockey game. Where were the Whalers miss Paul Coffey on the power play, just like Detroit has? Their power play will drop a few points without that great offensive defensive line. Bruins and Penguins in a wild affair. Scoreless the first. J.J. Daniel and Mario Lemieux were scoreless no longer. 16 for 66. Penguins on the power play in the first. Steve Hines. Rister by Ken Reagan. That's a shorthanded goal tied at 1-1. Second, still at 1-1. Brett Harkin drops it off to Sheldon Kennedy, and the Barry Melrose product scores his first of the year, and then the hitting, Barry. You're going to see a hit here by Kasparitis. That is a legal hit, folks, but that's an attempt to injure. It should be outlawed. Second period, 3-1 Bruins. Don Sweeney's shot is stopped, but Tim Sweeney puts home the rebound. 4-1 Boston. Then Mario Lemieux on the break. Watch him pulled down by John Roloff. If you're going to pull him down, you got to pull him down earlier. He scores the goal, make it 4-2. Boston scores two more. And what is going on tonight? The Bruins a 6-2 lead in Pitt. I'm going to tell you what happened. Pittsburgh saw Bruins come in. No goals in two games. They're licking their li lips. They're going to get a bunch of goals tonight. Took them too lightly. Now they're down 6-2. Eddie Johnson's going to be crazy. Islanders and Kings from Nassau Coliseum. Kai Nermanen would pick up the first goal. Dimitri Kristic back of the net. Kristic off the turnover, and Newman it pops it home for Los Angeles. That made it 1-0 in favor of the Kings. Islanders will attempt to come back, but Stefan Fosse, they're able to make the save on the shot from the point. Islanders, Scott Lachance cruising the crease, and the defenseman in deep gets the goal there on the neat feed. And Marty McKinnis right to Nicholas Anderson from Nicholas Anderson. They get the goal on the power play, and the Islanders have a 3 2 lead. They're late in the second there, Bear. The names that are being mentioned Tommy Tallow is playing great for the Islanders. One of the reasons they're playing well right now. Nicholas Anderson's name is all over the place. That kid has really picked it up for the Islanders. Us. They're playing much better now. And one other game to share with you Washington and Phoenix. And they are scoreless. In the first, there we are, scoreless in the first. The Capitals have struggled with one win in their last nine. Adam Denmark's ninth goal of the year was the only goal of our first Korea tonight. He gave Colorado a 1 nothing lead. Jenny been benched. We all know about Brett Hall being benched. Hey, Roman Hammerlink and Tap from Tampa Bay, he was asked to sit down. Daze was dazed when he was benched in St. Louis, but in Vancouver, they didn't do that. They challenged Pavel Burry and Alexander McGillney another way. They said you were totally outplayed by those two guys from Colorado, Forsberg and Sackick. They put them on the same line, kind of like that thing in Pittsburgh, and the lucky guy in the middle, he's the ticket, and boy, he's licking his lips. That's a nice assignment, and they come up with, what, 11 points as, as a line and an 8 to nothing win. That team is going to be playing great guns with that line right there if they keep going, so look for them to score some big points in Chicago. Chicago. This guy's not going to take a lot of the blame, and he shouldn't for what's happened in Chicago. Bob Pulford, the general manager, has come out and admitted, hey, our job is to get some players and maybe not let some go. Wouldn't Bernie Nichols look good right back in Chicago? 23 points would be... This court to get it away from. That is Kusilov to try to defend against him, and he's just got such great leg drive. Here we are again. He's getting around Mike Keane on this play. Decided to reverse. Made a nice play across the slot for a scoring chance. Back to the number one spot where they've been for the last two seasons. More importantly, to the cup. Larry on off bad pass. Young shot. Deflected. Young. Trying to wind up again. Couldn't. Keane over there. Better off. Got it. Bad play by Detroit. Pass right into the middle. But Young was tied up before he had an opportunity. Back come the Red Wings. Better off down low. That one's intercepted by Adam Foote. Foot, nice play to get the puck to himself. Hands it high off the glass over Kerry Fraser's head near side. Sent out. 
Back on the attack, reaches the trailer, Young the shot, Brennan with a big glove save, drops it off behind the net, slap it for Thiesop, overskated that puck, rolled up far side, Greg Johnson couldn't get it out of there, dumped into the middle, save, rebound, great save by Brennan! Oh, what an opportunity in the near side for Eric Lacroix! Lacroix, the shot, Vernon, about the third spectacular save that he has made in this game. Dump back off the near sideline. Dead Marsh clears it back up and out. And this one will roll in. Vernon's got to play it. And Lacroix moving in. It'll be touched first, though, by Fatisov, and that'll get the ice. Well, you, know, you know, it's Mike Vernon doesn't usually have to make these saves, nor does Chris Osgood, nor does Kevin Hodson, because the Detroit Red Wings usually don't give up that many rebounds. You don't get second chances at it. In this game, the Avalanche have been able to drive the net and get rebounds. Mike Ricci, you know where he lives. He lives from the crease in, or at least on the edge of the crease. And when the play is in front of Mike Vernon, it's Mike Ricci that's going to be there trying to throw Vernon off. He deflected the first one, and then the Lacroix shot is how Mike Vernon dove for the... There it is right there, that great paddle of his stick save on Eric Lacroix. And then Mike Vernon came back and said, Hey, pal, you're in my home now. Out. Vernon on Ricci. Ricci can be a real spur against the other team and a big hit on Rene Corbet oh. and he is hurt. Man. He is really hurt. He is down and not moving and I think he's bleeding. I think it was Aaron Ward that hit him. 27. Him. They hit him. Oh gosh. It looked like a pretty clean hit. He may have let up because the whistle was about to blow. But you wouldn't think that he would let up knowing that Aaron Ward was really barreling down on him. I think the, the Lance, the Avalanche, must think that it was a, a reasonable hit as well because nobody's gone after Aaron Ward. What happens, of course, with these two teams as a result of that playoff injury that was picked up last year is that every time something like this happens, it just fuels the fire again. Chris Draper, the man who got seriously hurt on the hit, by Lemieux, Claude Lemieux, who himself is out of the lineup with the abdominal operation, not playing yet this year, back at the All-Star Big, probably. So when these things happen between these two teams, it's that fire again. Yeah, spoke. exactly. But this is uh, one of the reasons that the NHL is going to start investigating the safety level of helmets in the NHL. Because of concussions and because of head injuries, and Rene Corbet definitely suffered a head injury on this play. Well, we're going to take a look at it. They come from the right. There's Corbet, number 20. Taken into the boards. Ward looked like he kept his arms down. Corbet comes off the glass, then goes down. Oh, oh baby. Man. Head first. That is why Rene Corbet is lying in a pool of blood. He didn't look like he was able to get his arms loose to cushion his fall. Aaron Ward just took him hard to the boards, but when Corbet came off, his feet went up and his head went down. They are calling for uh, medical assistance here in a stretcher. Ironically, after the general uh, GM meetings that took place about a week and a half ago, Gary Bettman, one of the announcements that came out of that was a review of helmets used in the National Hockey League. Yep. You're out there, asked him to clench his fist, and he did that for him, moved his arms. Mm -hmm. Al Morganti uh, is down there at ice level, but they're obviously going to be very careful here just to make sure that in this kind of situation that there isn't any further damage done in moving him. Al Morganti? Thanks, Gary. Yes, they immediately they sent for a stretcher here, obviously to stabilize him out there. There is a doctor on the ice almost immediately. Uh, as you said, nobody chased uh, a ward. It, did, it looked like a clean hit from here. Now just the concern um, to get him off the ice now. And there is an ambulance, it looks like, waiting for him, uh, right in behind me here as they kind of wheel him, uh, get ready to put him on the stretcher and, and bring him off. Uh, with quick medical, quick medical help here in Denver, and uh, everybody out there working on him now. Uh, players genuinely concerned, and as you said, Billy, it's it's having. You obviously have been a player. You look for the same things. I heard some players going by. Are his legs moving? Are his arms moving? They're all looking for the same thing. Yeah, we'll uh, probably get a little better idea of his condition when we see whether or not there's a neck brace on him. He did hit the side of his head, and you can assume that that's where the blood was coming from. But he also went down head first, which. It put a great strain on the neck. And you can see just by looking at those helmets, you're not going to get much protection when you take a clunk like that on the ice. Gary, some are way better than others. And 
conversely, some are nearly good enough. One more look at it. Aaron Ward just rode him off the puck and rode him to the boards. Ow. Brings back memories of the Kevin Stevens collapse in 1993 in Pittsburgh in the conference finals against the New York Islanders when he went face first into the ice. So a team already suffering through uh, an injury time frame. We'll have another player who is going to be gone here and uh, hopefully not seriously. We'll get an update here as uh, as we learn of it. Avalanche lead at one nothing. Looking off the ice as you see on the stretcher, and they've uh, made sure they've stabilized him, obviously. As Al said, the ambulance is right there at the uh, Zamboni door. And it looks as if he does, Randy Corbet does have a neck brace on, and they haven't even removed his helmet, so they obviously did not want to move his neck or his head at all, keep him stable. So, players will have to get themselves together to wind up and uh, start this game over again. Keep you updated on the other games going on in the National Hockey League on our Bud Ice scoreboard. And during our second intermission, again, we'll take you back as uh, Steve Levy and Barry Melrose will be there with highlights and comments on the games that are ongoing. All right, it is a 1-0 lead for the Avalanche. Power play goal came in the first period. We're just underway here in the second period. 17.46 to go in it. And it'll be jumped back in behind the net to Patrick Wild and then comes back to get it. Fans were booing here. They wanted a penalty on the play, but it didn't look like Aaron Ward committed any foul at all on Randy Corbett. Uh, and as uh, we said, Bill, the other oh. players weren't. A big pile up in front of Patrick Wild. A loose puck. Federoff found it and roofed it over Wild. Tying the game at one. This won't go on Sergei Fedorov's highlight reel because it just squirted out to him. But nevertheless, it gives him goals in six of the Red Wings' last seven games. And you can see there were three Avalanche players trying to contain Darren McCarty. Obviously, that left somebody open. That somebody happened to be 91, but Scott Young let him go. You saw on the bottom right of your screen how Scott Young had Sergei Fedorov and just decided that he was going to let him go, and Fedorov smartly stepped to the left. That's where the puck went. So Fedorov gets his 11th on uh, this pile up in front boy will this be a big plus for Detroit if he is really going to go in an extended goal scoring streak. Oh, you bet I mean Sergei Fedorov's big problem against Colorado in the playoffs last year was his inability to score to generate offense Detroit was still a, a real strong defensive team but not good enough offensively to beat Colorado well, this is a confidence builder for Sergei Fedorov right here. Each team with a dozen shots, each team with a goal. Fedorov from McCarty and Shanahan at 3-10 here in the second period to tie this game up. And, I, and it looks as if that's going to stay at the line. I wondered if it was just a quick change with Steve Eisenman going off, but Scotty's juggled. Steve Eisenman has typically played with Brendan Shanahan and Darren McCarty, but now it's Fedorov. against the post coming on now with Joe Sackett's line matched up against this line it's a little different Sergey Fedorov plays a much stronger game than Steve Eiserman he's a power forward he's going to be harder for Joe Sackett to play against one-on-one -on -one. so all of a sudden with Fedorov between McCarty and Shanahan all kinds of action in Colorado's end including this action Patrick Waugh had a that, that puck had to have a tremendous spin on it it hit Patrick's blade and just came right out front watch this and he was trying to shoot it up the boards and the spin on the puck went out and Fedorov had not much angle, but enough, hit the post. Wow, what a chance. We understand Rene Corbet, uh, they're not taking him out of the building at the moment. He has gone into the training room, so the doctor will take a look at him there. Now we can he's here, we'll update us as soon as we have a report. Third back out through center, dancing in front of the net while going down. Puts it home and Detroit has got a 2-1 lead. Two shifts and two goals 
those were these retooled lines by Scotty Bowman. The Fedorov, the new Fedorov line came out. Wham! Steve Eisenman between Johnson and Igor Larionov. They scored. Jamie Pusher kept it in on the blue line. Good job. Adam Foote, a much bigger, stronger man than, than Greg Johnson. But Johnson going down just wouldn't quit on this. I mean, full marks for Greg Johnson. Boy, he was taken down by Adam Foote. He just wouldn't give up on it. And still, Patrick Watt doesn't usually lose his footing like that on the original save, but he wasn't in position for the Johnson rebound shot. Only his second goal. It's his first goal since October 23 when he got one against Dallas. He gets one here, and Mark Crawford has called a timeout. He is not happy with the way his team is performing right now. This has been a problem in the last dozen games for Colorado. They have played spurts where they've done well and then seemingly have gone into a little cocoon and floated periods away that have cost them. They looked good in the first period to a great degree because Detroit let them make those long passes. I don't think they were tested all that much defensively, but now that Detroit has really kind of settled their game down, and, and Detroit has to play like a machine. They play a solid defensive system, the left wing lock, so they try never to give up odd man rushes. They're patient. They wait for their chances to score goals the way they scored in this game. The two goals that they've got, they're back to playing that way in this game now. To Patrick Wall with the first save in his butterfly style, and he just wasn't able to get over there. You, you got to know that Patrick Waugh there figured Adam Foot should be able to take Greg Johnson. So he went to the butterfly, made the save, but he did put the rebound right out front. And it was put home. Johnson second of the year. Pusher and Eiserman get the assists on it. It comes at 5-16. So Detroit, the last two goals, one at 3-10, one at 5-16. They've got the 2-1 lead. Mike Vernon plays that one off the glass. Glenn able to hold it in against Fedorov. Fedorov now takes it away and jams it out through center. For the second time these teams have met this season. Detroit won. Uh, Avalanche, rather, won in Detroit by a score of 4-1 in that other meeting. Big hit put on near side. All the battle goes out. Mark down the point. He's into it there in Miller. At the Avalanche. Miller holds it in on the far side. Behind the net, Mike Vernon. Crawford, obviously, you saw him letting his team have it over there in the bench, calling the timeout here in the second period. Jumped ahead, cutting to the net. Taylor looking, shot, save, lob, and a rebound. Loose, breaker, deep shot, wide, rebound, deflected right across the top. Second rebound right out front. Patrick Waugh struggling a bit, controlling the puck. Konstantinov on the touch for the icing call against the Avs. But, but even before he had to make the save, Gary, I mean, you mentioned Mark Crawford's timeout. No sooner did you mention that than, bang, the Red Wings come back with a two-on-one. I mean, the Avalanche have to try to match Detroit defensively, especially in this game. Started without Claude Lemieux, without Forsberg, without Stefan Yell, and now without Rene Corbet. They can't go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. There, there's the rebound, this last one, that bounced right out. He got some help from his defenseman. I don't think Draper wants one. 33 Ooh. with that last shot. Draper will be out there. Patrick Wild will have the faceoff coming to his left side. There you see the shots on here. 7-5 in this period in favor of the Wings. A 2-1 lead for Detroit on the draw. Shot deflected wide. Patrick Wild trying to cover. Doesn't know where it is. Went to the corner. Johnson back there. Rebound shot. Wild the save. Moving up for Tisov. His shot. Save made Patrick Detroit's all over the place territorially here in this second period. The fans trying to rev it up for the end. Back into the middle. Some big hits going on away from the play. Konstantinov just took a shot at the other end. Draper cleared it into the zone, but uh, no, no whistle. Everybody moving it in, but look at this. There was no whistle on any of this, but the players were just waiting for something to break out. Gary, I think there was a whistle, and half of them heard it, and half of them didn't. We didn't hear it. But it sure looked like everybody stopped. The court, the linesman blew it down. I mean, he signaled offside, and he it looked like he was trying to blow his whistle. Dan McCourt. And apparently a couple of players either didn't hear it or chose not to hear it as they were barreling in behind the net. And it was Bob Barry who was involved in it again. Barry has already picked up a couple of double minors in this game. These two teams who readily admit they do not like one another are proving it. This is before this last sequence. Eric Lacroix taking on the number one hated man. 
Vladimir Konstantinov. The Lance try to dump it into Konstantinov's corner so they can punish him and keep him from coming across the ice for his big hits. And this is the play as we stop play. The action after the whistle. We assume that there was a whistle. I mean, I'm assuming that there was a whistle that at least some of the players heard and some didn't because Dan McCord signaled offside. Bob Airy is going back into the penalty box. There he is. Adam Foote is already in there on the other side. <laughs> so we'll see what the final numbers are as Kerry Fraser makes the calls here and see whether or not anybody gets the advantage out of this with Detroit leading at 2-1-L. Thanks, Gary. Well, the news is good on Rene Corbet. Everybody worried when he was taken off the ice. He has been taken to a local hospital, but just for precautionary reasons. He's moving his arms and legs. They say he's regained consciousness. Once again, they've just brought him to the hospital for precautionary reasons. So the news is good on Rene Corbet. Gary, Bill? Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. Good. You bet. That might be bad news for the normal person that has a normal job, but for a hockey player, it can be much worse than that. So just a concussion and a gash in the head is good news. So you see the two are in the air. Airy uh, goes for boarding and foot goes for high sticking, matching minors at 650. So there'll be no power play. There will be our first four on four situation in this game. Psychic lost that face off as it was won by Steve Eiserman against uh, this Colorado team, including the days up in uh, Quebec. He is 14, 8, and 1. But check that. Vernon rather called 3 and 4 on the other side. That'll end up as a souvenir in the seats, and we'll get another whistle. There is Fedorov, who's played like a house of fire in this game, and has picked up points here tonight in the 2 1 Detroit lead. 120 points in the 93 94 season. The Hart Trophy winner in the National Hockey League is the MVP. The big question for Sergei Fedorov after the last couple of playoff rounds that he played last season is, can he score in big situations to lead the Red Wings to the Stanley Cup? And he still has some proving to do in that department. Can't do that until you get back into the playoffs. Yep. And that's what yeah, he wants to make that known. Konstantinov gets the hit sack again. Shot save made by Vernon. Vernon knocked that one away. Good play. Vernon has made some spectacular saves in this game. Ozolins takes it back in behind the net. And it's Ozolins dumping that one up. Had a kick away in front. Lariano scores! A turnover by the Avalanche. And the Detroit Red Wings, three unanswered goals, have taken a 3-1 lead. Patient. Wait for the chances. Do what you got to do. Yep. I mean, that's exactly what Larionov did. But it was a pass that went into the skates that, that really hurt Colorado, and that's how they turned the puck over. Here comes Gusrov. He's going to move it up to the side here. Watch what happens. He puts it into his teammate's skates. And if we stop it right here, you can see there's the player that had to go into his skates, and here is Larionov. He's going to just make a beeline for the net because it went right out off the skates to Larionov, and he just ripped it. So, I mean, it was a bad pass by Gusarov that caused the turnover. Colorado gives up only 2.2 a game, third best defensively. The Red Wings already have three in this game, and we're not quite halfway through the game. Detroit three goals in a matter of five minutes and 18 seconds as Lariano picks up his fourth of the year. And the Red Wings keep right on bringing. Back in behind the was Tim Taylor, tried to drop it off. Once the comes in to get it. Unassisted on Lariano's goal at 8.28. Intercepted again, Taylor. Rosa Lynch finds it. Vernon has to be mad at himself. He has to be. And he's still shrugging the shoulders. You can tell he's talking to himself in there. He took a big gamble, and it didn't work. Games over 500 before Thanksgiving. Since then, bad, there's 600. Well, Steve, I'm going to tell you what's happened here with Watson. Yes, they have a lot of injuries, and that's great. But what's happened is... The press have made such a big deal of the TV have made such a big deal of poor Washington, poor this, poor that. It doesn't matter who you got in the lineup. You have to win in the NHL. No one cares if you have injuries. Washington made too big a deal of this injury. They've got to forget about it. You've got to win every night, and that's what Jimmy Schoenfeld and the staff has to do. These guys have to win no matter who's hurt, no matter who's in the lineup. It is poor Washington in terms of goal scoring. Sixth lowest scoring team in the NHL. Now, last night in New York, the Rangers beat the Whalers by a score of 5-2. Wayne Gretzky moved into the NHL scoring lead with his 14th goal. And it's just not fair. Not fair for the great one to beat a 19-year-old rookie goaltender like John Sebastian Jaguar the way he would. Now, Gretzky would try to score later a different way. People say, why don't Wayne fight a little bit more? Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to see why right there. How oh, look at that around.
Right now is almost right. Now the serious stuff. Shane Turla, first game back after missing 11 with a broken orbital bone. He's playing with the shield to protect the eye from another blow and permanent damage. Well, here's what happened. Grimson comes in to protect his teammate, and the stick got too high on Turla, and he sticks up for himself right here. Now, I think the question, Barry, a lot of people ask is, why is Turla in the lineup in the first place? I talked to Ranger coach Colin Campbell today, and he said, A, because Shane's been bugging him for a couple of weeks to make him play, and also that uh, Coley said he wouldn't have put him in the lineup, but Churla promised he would not get an altercation. Broke his promise, I guess Shane lied. The bottom line is I love Shane Churla too, but he is a, he's a guy that protects everybody else. He must be able to fight if he's going to play and be effective. He must protect Messier, he must protect Gretzky, he must win those fights or else the team becomes flat. Right now the way he's playing with that mask on, with the orbital bone, he can't be the Shane Churla that we all love and the tough guy that we saw. He cannot do that. He shouldn't be playing without injury. He should be waiting, rest, and get ready to go. Churla suffered 30 stitches, although no further damage to the orbital bone, the original injury, so that's the good news. Coley said he wasn't sure if Shane would go to not tomorrow night. He can be sure Gretzky will go against the Kings on the Duke. Game win streak is over, and we'll have more NBA later on this edition of the show. But let's go to hockey now, and the Maple Leafs on the road again. Uh-oh, say the fans. Leafs have been brutal on the road this season and at home lately for that matter. Losers of 13 of their last 16 games as they head to San Jose to start a three-game Western swing. The Sharks, two points ahead of the last place Leafs in the Western Conference. Doug Gilmore, certainly the subject of some trade rumors lately and one uh, of the Leafs that really has to start stepping it up. And 45 seconds into the game, Killer Gilmore does step it up, blasting that loose puck in over Kelly Rudy. one nothing Toronto. Later, Greg Hoggood shot from the point for the Sharks, tipped by Tony Granato. And we are tied at one. A little bit later, Darby Hendrickson, one of the young Leafs, will pounce on a rebound in the slot here and knock it in. Comes back out, but it was in, make it 2-1 Toronto. Second period, Leafs add another. Kirk Muller steaming down the wing, beats Chris Terreri, freezes him with the fake, and then buries that in the top corner. What a great goal. 3-1 Toronto. 3-2 Leafs later, Andre Nazarov cuts in front, snaps it past Potvan, and we are tied at three at the Shark Tank. Third period, though, the Leafs roar. Two goals in three minutes. Game winner, Sundin, feeding Sergei Berezet. Quick wrist shot, and Terreri can't get anything. 4-3 Leafs, and they go on to win by a score of 6-3. A very important road win for Toronto. They snap a three-game losing streak. They've also taken five of the last six meetings between themselves and the Sharks. Matt Sundin, up to 19 goals on the season. Okay, let's go on to the Red Wings and the Avalanche in Colorado. And Mike Vernon, kind of a surprise starter for the Red Wings in this one. First period, Sandus Ozelinch. Great pass with Adam Denmark cruising through the slot. Power play goal, 1-0 Colorado. Second period, scary we'll moment. Aaron Ward of the Red Wings drills Rennie Corbet into the boards. The way Corbet falls is scary, though. Hits his head, lies motionless on the ice for several minutes. He was bleeding, took him off on a stretcher. Concussion is the word, and the word is he'll be okay. 1-1 in the second as we pick up the action. Greg Johnson, great effort. Guy sprawling all over him. And he lifts it over Patrick Watt, 2-1 Detroit. 3-1 wings later. Valerie Kamensky, though, all the way around the net. Vernon, bad move to come out there because... ...who stabbed Monica Sullis in the back. Now another judge has failed to blame the German Tennis Federation for the stabbing. That judge on Thursday dismissed a civil suit filed by Monica Sullis. Sullis was seeking more than $15 million in damages for lost income, blaming the German Tennis Federation for a lack of security at the Citizens' Cup tournament in Hamburg. Sellis was sidelined for more than two years after being stabbed in the back by the German spectator during a changeover in her quarterfinal match against Magdalena Maleva. Not only does Sellis not get any money because she brought the suit forward, she will be required to pay the cost of the hearing. There is the possibility, however, that she will appeal the decision. Let's take our final commercial break, and as we do, take a look at the CHL. Paralyzing spinal cord injuries are on the rise in hockey. They now outnumber diving accidents two to one. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Cruz. Checking from behind has every level of hockey concern from house leagues to the minor leagues on up to the NHL. The Canadian Hockey Association calls it the worst problem they've had to deal with in the last 50 years. Join us on Friday for our special report that will look at the problem and what they're doing to remove it from the game. That's Friday on Sports Day. People knew the Izvestia Cup hockey tournament would be a struggle for Team Canada, and it has been exactly that. Canada was shut out 6 to nothing by the Russians. They are now 0-3 at the week-long round-robin tournament, and it is not a pretty 0-3. The inexperienced Canadians have been outscored 17-2. Inexperience, though, doesn't always cripple the team. Just look at the Florida Panthers. With limited playoff experience last year, the Panthers 
went to the final and this year the young squad is playing solid veteran style hockey again both at home and on the road mark bunting reports the word fluke doesn't seem to be in the florida panthers vocabulary after reaching the stanley cup final last season there were many skeptics who thought that the panthers were merely a one-time phenomenon but with florida sitting on top of the nhl standings those skeptics are nowhere to be found now you guys came in with uh um, you know, with last year on our mind, and, and it was one that we weren't going to we weren't going to sit and uh, and kind of dwell on it and, and to try and live off of that. It was something that we were we were that close, we were one step away, and, and we uh, you know we came in and we kind of talked about it, and we wanted to uh, make that next step. Last season, the Panthers won a few games because they were underestimated by their opponents. This season, every team is ready for Florida, but few can match the Panthers' work ethic. The teams are much better prepared, and and. We're getting a tremendous amount of respect, which I thought we got last year from, from most teams. The Panthers' formula for success remains the same. Brilliant goaltending from John Van Beesbrook and 18 relentless skaters dedicated to team success. A lot of the team's future success hinges on the development of young players such as Ed Jovanovski and Radek Dvorak. The young guys that came in last year obviously got a year under the belt now and you know, are playing more confident now. So, I mean, that always helps. And, you know, the, the older guys, uh, same as usual, carrying this uh, team with character and a lot of pride and a lot of leadership. And I think, uh, you know, when you have a combination of those two, a uh, team can go a long way. Well, that's a huge part of, of what's happened. Dvorak stepped up and just our younger players are getting better. And I think that's, I mean, even last year, I think that was part of the reason we got great leadership and with our younger guys developing, I think it makes us a good team. General Manager Brian Murray has tinkered with his personnel this season. The biggest move brought big center Chris Wells over from Pittsburgh for Stu Barnes and Jason Woolley. It's a real team here. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, there are not, not a lot of superstars on our team and, uh, you know, everyone, everyone works together and everyone's pretty equal here and you know it's uh it's, more, it's real uh team oriented and everyone you know works works together and for each other and uh i think that that's really helpful with our success this year i have very few beefs right now i mean i i, I have a group that uh, that plays extremely hard and works extremely hard and as a coaching staff if you get that you know you, you're not going to win every night but if you know they gave a full effort it's tough to ask for much more than that mark bunting tsn Thank you, Mark. Well, on the day when that Mike Keenan was banished from St. Louis, we thought you might find this commercial amusing. It's for hockey on the Fox Network, and Gretzky doesn't mind poking fun at his less than successful stint in St. Louis and his being reunited with Mark Messier in New York. On June 13th, Wayne Gretzky left his place of residence never to return. Not knowing exactly where to go, he found himself on the team of his friend Mark Messier. Can two men with different styles play together without driving each other insane? Stay tuned. And that music really brings back memories, doesn't it? Time now for our Wendy's Highlight of the Night. And for this one, we head to the Miami Arena and take a look at the work by Tim Hardaway. Hardaway with a great... And welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Rod Smith. What do the Toronto Maple Leafs have in common with the Stanley Cup champions? Not much, except, of course, for injuries. The Leafs faced Colorado on Saturday night, a meeting of the worst and first in the NHL's Western Conference. The Leafs, of course, without Wendell Clark and Matthew Schneider. But consider who's missing from the avalanche. A long list, including Peter Forsberg, Claude Lemieux, Sylvain Lefebvre. Certainly not a big advantage for Colorado when you think of them all out. Canadian diver Andy Pelche on hand to see this, Curtis, Olympic medalist. Felix Potvin, he's needed a medal lately. All the shots he's faced and takes some pressure here. Adam Deadmarsh behind the net off Larry Murphy's skate. Kamensky stopped. Then on the rebound there, Ozilin stopped by the cat as well. Less than a minute left in the first. Leafs get on the board. Warner with the shot. Sundin the rebound beats Patrick Waugh. It is actually 2-0 at that point. Second period, 3-1. Frederick Modine on the rebound from Sundin. 4-1 Leafs in control. Now leading 4-2 in the third. Gilmore steals it, gets it over to you-know-who, Matt Sundin with a hat trick on the evening. 5-2 at that point, and the Leafs go on. Surprise, surprise. Despite all those Colorado injuries, you'd have to think the Avalanche would have been favored. 6-2 in that one, and for Sundin, that is his fifth career hat trick. Move on now to the Rangers in Montreal. They haven't won a regular season game in Montreal since October of 91. Second period, big scrap. Shane Churla. 
been hurt a lot lately. Scott Thornton, they really go at it. Surely gets a cut Thornton, possible broken left ring finger. Midway through the second, familiar sight. Wayne Gretzky behind the net, setting up Ulf Samuelson to tie this one up at one apiece. Later on the Habs power play, Vladimir Malikov. The shot is stopped. Dampfus. Vincent Dampfus puts it home. It's 2-1 for the Habs. Late second. Alexander Karpatsit keeps it in to you-know-who. Gretzky behind the net. Nicholas Sundstrom this time. It's 2-2. Gretzky's 50th point of the season. Third. Wayne Gretzky is tired of being hassled by Brisbois. Takes out his frustration. You don't see that very often. He'd go to the box for it. So we go to OT. Gretzky's back on the ice. Is he ever on the ice? Eight seconds behind the net. Do you believe this? Could pitch a tent. Finally puts it in front to Luke Robitaille, and there you go in overtime. The Rangers do win it in Montreal, 3-2. The Rangers get their first regular season win in more than five years. Robitaille has seven goals in his last ten games. What a game by Gretzky. Move it down to Ottawa. Senator Sabres, first period power play. Yanni Lokanen, the big shot. Beats Dominic Hasek, 1-0 sends. Buffalo answers. Dixon Ward to Donald Audette. With his 11th of the season right there, Adet, game tied at one. And then it is Brian Holsinger. He's been on fire lately. Left alone in front, his 11th of the year, 2-1 Buffalo. Third period, it is tied at two. And watch Mike Pekka. Gets in alone. No mistake. Sabres up 3-2. Then time is winding down for Steve Duchesne. Comes in off the point, pops it home. Tie game right. Uh, no. They go upstairs for... Another look at it, and it is ruled that the Sens were in the crease. No goal. Buffalo hangs on. Sabres take it 3-2. to two. More bad uh, news for the Senators. They've just one win in their last eight home games. Sabres have won four straight. Moving on to a wild one now. You're right when you do these things. Bottom line is these kids represent our future. And, um... International hockey action between Canada and Finland. This is TSN, coast to coast. Brett Hall shoots for 501. Ranger fans might have wanted him, but surely Boo can be Luke, the way Robotai's playing. And the Habs and the Canucks are on TSN hoping to redeem themselves. Hey everybody, I'm Sunny from the World Wrestling Federation, and that's hockey. Boxing Day, Wrestling Day, uh, close enough. Welcome and season's greetings. The NHL's two-day Christmas break comes and goes quickly, and 18 teams get back into action tonight. Some of them may be anxious to play again soon to get a chance to wipe out the memories attached to their last pre-Christmas game. The Montreal Canadiens and Vancouver Canucks would be two of those teams, and you'll see them on TSN tonight, the Canadiens in Pittsburgh after a 6-0 home ice loss to Ottawa, and the Canucks in San Jose, trying to forget a 7-0 loss to Edmonton. Meanwhile, Brett Hull might have preferred a few more days off to savor goal number 500, which came last Sunday night against Los Angeles, one of three goals he scored in that game. Hull and the St. Louis Blues play in Chicago tonight. Brett, I must say your timing is impeccable, number 500, just in time for Christmas at home and uh, arguably when the Blues needed it the most. Well, I think you're right. You know, we've gone through uh, a little bit of turmoil here for uh, a couple of weeks, and uh, it was nice. Uh, been waiting a long time to get it, so it was nice uh, no matter what night it was. But uh, like you said, I think the uh, organization, the team, and uh, all the fans uh, at the game really needed uh, something to cheer about. As I watched uh, Stefan Matteau score your 500th goal, as it were, uh, the only word that came to my mind was awkward. What were you thinking as all of that was going on? Well, uh, I think you were right with the... Uh, uh, you know, it was very awkward because I was trying to tell everybody that it wasn't my goal. It clearly hit uh, Steph right in the knee and went in. And, uh, you know, it just it reminded me of the first time I uh, scored my 50th goal, and it was against Toronto at home. And uh, I banked one in off of Paul McLean as well. So I had to wait till later in the game to get that as well. So uh, I had gone through it before. But the celebration uh, uh, was great either way. Did you give those hats back? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I ended up getting it later. I think we would have had to. Uh, how sweet then to score the, the 500th legitimately the same night. It might have been uh, doubly awkward to, to finish the game with 499. Well, it would have, and it was, it was nice. Uh, that's what we said when we got back to the bench was uh, 
let's just go out and do our best to get another one so this is uh, uh, immaterial. Uh, Brad, I know Mike Keenan isn't your favorite topic, but could I simply ask you how you uh, found out that he was fired? Uh, I, th that morning I was uh, almost halfway dressed to uh, go on for a morning skate, and uh, I was called into the uh, office of Mr. Ritter, and uh, he let me in on the news. And what was your reaction? Well, i got to be honest with you, I, I was kind of shocked. I, uh, I don't think anyone was expecting it uh, uh, two days before that in the, the St. Louis paper. Uh, uh, they were almost given a uh, vote of confidence by the management. And, uh, but you know what, I said that to someone, and I said that's almost the kiss of death. But uh, it was more of a shock, but uh, almost a relief, too, to, to have, uh, uh, to have the, the, the pain going away. It was just every day there was something new. Uh, in the papers and in the media and something else was happening and it was nice, uh, just a uh, relief to have it over with and having something done. This almost paves the way one uh, would think for you to finish your career in St. Louis. That has been your intention all along. Uh, did, it, did it ever waver uh, given the, the climate of the couple of years past? Well, I'll tell you, I never uh, wanted to leave St. Louis, that's for sure, but there, I got to be honest with you, there was times when I was uh, very close to just going in and say, just uh, uh, get me out of here and get me out of my misery. But I'm so glad I didn't do that because uh, St. Louis is a great hockey town and it's a great city with great people. And uh, uh, I'm glad I'm going to get the opportunity to finish there. What made you change your mind? Because a lot of people would have thought this is, this is sort of a natural reaction that if Brett Hall goes and asks to be traded, A, he'll be traded, or B, something will happen to make him... Uh, uh, not want to be traded, you, but you never, you never did that mouth those words. No, I never did. I, uh, you know, as close as I came, uh, uh, I've been treated so great throughout my years in St. Louis, and uh, I couldn't imagine playing uh, in another uniform. And uh, uh, it almost came to the point where uh, I was, I was deciding that I was going to retire if uh, uh, Mike ever got his wish and was able to trade me. But uh, uh, you know, that's over, and this team's going in a new direction. And uh, you know, I wish the, the best for everyone involved. What do you think the next coach has to do uh, to handle a situation properly? Well, there's no situation to handle. Uh, you know, you just uh, go out and uh, I don't know how things ever escalated to where they were, but, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, that's the first problem that uh, uh, we've ever had in St. Louis, uh, from, from Brian Sutter to Bob Berry to, uh, uh, well, those are the only two guys really that have been there any length of time since I've been there. But, uh, you know, we've got a good group of guys, uh, veterans and some, some good young kids and we got a good supporting staff with the trainers and uh, it should be very easy to come in and, uh, and enjoy yourself. But should it be a coach who's had lots of experience or a younger guy who's getting his, his first crack? Do you have any opinions on what uh, should happen as far as the next coach is concerned? Well, I think everyone has their opinions, but I think uh, the only ones that matter are uh, uh, the bosses and I think uh, they said it best when they uh, uh, made the change and they're looking for uh, the fan base to come back and the popularity of St. Louis hockey and the St. Louis hockey players to get back in the community and uh, get the enthusiasm we had a few years ago and uh, I think they're going to look for someone who's got that ability to do that and uh, I'm sure that uh, one of the priorities is maybe that they've uh, been in the St. Louis uh, uh, hockey club before or, or somewhat uh, uh, close to it. Is it uh, easy or difficult now to play while waiting for the next coach to arrive? Well, I think it's it's a little bit of both. It's it's difficult to uh, uh, to try to get things going uh, after the change and to get a new direction. But I think it's it's easier for the players. Uh, we all know uh, how Mike Keenan was coach. He was uh, uh, he was very hard and that and and uh, I think a lot of the players' confidence uh, with all the changes that were made and uh, transactions from uh, Worcester and back uh, uh, hurt a lot of people's confidence. And I think it's going to take a while to get that back, but. Uh, uh, I think the players are uh, enthusiastic and trying to go a different direction. Brett, if uh, St. Louis was the perfect place for 500, uh, 501 might go over nicely in Chicago, don't you think? I think so. I, uh, I said I was never going to look too far ahead. People asking me about uh, catching my father at 610. I, I said uh, I looked way too far ahead at number 500 uh, over the last year and a half, and uh, I just said I'm looking for 501 next. Good luck. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dave. Brett Hull is the fourth player in NHL history to get to 500 goals in less than 700 games. Wayne Gretzky's record might stand forever, and uh, Mike Bossy and Mario Lemieux are in that list as well, with Phil Esposito closest at 803. Probably the most embarrassing moments of my first year. 
rookie year in training camp, first day on the ice scrimmage. I guess I was a little nervous, but uh, started scrimmage and skating around and went in front of the net and I felt a little upset and I threw up right in Ronnie Lowe's uh, crease. <laughs> <laughs> so to this day, this day I told Ronnie that's why he's become a stand-up goalie. <laughs> that's Hockey with Dave Hodge, brought to you by MasterCard, the official card and payment system of the NHL. If you want to play in this game, you better be prepared to go all the way. And no matter where your game takes you, MasterCard will be there. Because no other card is accepted in more places worldwide than MasterCard. Not Visa. Not American Express. The official card of the NHL. MasterCard. Accepted across North America and around the world. Right who's under the helmet tonight? He was drafted 71st overall by Toronto in 1987, and he played for Team USA at the 1992 Olympics. Two more clues later in the show. Despite any trade talk that uh, preceded Mike Keenan's firing in St. Louis, Brett Hall remains with the Blues and is not destined to become a New York Ranger. Fans at Madison Square Garden were making their own deals when it seemed that Hall might be available and they sounded more than willing to offer Luke Robitaille in return. Well, Robitaille was hearing it from the New York fans, but that has changed in recent games to coincide with a hot streak for the Rangers. They're in Ottawa tonight, where Luke has always had support since his junior days in Hull. Luke, the Rangers went into the Christmas break on a positive note, and for you personally, I would think the last few games were very satisfying. Yeah, the whole team has been playing real well. I'd say the last uh, maybe 12 games since we played in Phoenix, uh, seem like we've turned our season around. How much does it hurt when fans express their displeasure, not only by uh, booing, but by chanting the name of the player they prefer to see in your place? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I think I always try to see things in a positive way, and uh, for sure, uh, you know, you don't like it, but, uh, you know, people pay to watch the game. They're allowed to do whatever they want, but for me, when that happened, I just want to make sure I could turn it around, and uh, the last few games, they haven't been yelling anything, and they've, they've been real good to me, and and all in all, I think the fans in New York have been real good to me the last two years. They've been real patient. And I think in another way, it's, it's normal that they expect a little bit of some players when, when they see the production isn't there. So uh, for me, all I want to do is turn it around, and that's what I got to keep doing. And sometimes I think fans boo contracts these days. They, they know <laughs> what you're making. They decide it's uh, too much for what you're contributing, and that's why they're booing. You look at it that way? Well, yeah, but... Uh, that's fair, you know. I was, you know, I was very happy when I signed the contract, and I, I put my name on the paper. And uh, if you're gonna take uh, all the good things, sometimes bad things are gonna happen. And uh, like I said, I have a lot of pride, and all I was worried about, I just wanted to turn it around. And uh, you know, for me, that's it, it was another little bit of a challenge. And, and in a way, uh, you know, it's fun when you, when you come through, and if you if you can turn things around uh, it makes it makes it that much worthwhile you know it, it makes you appreciate things even more well and you did seem to keep your confidence through all of that your play reflects that now and everything you said at the time was uh, you know it suggested that you had not lost confidence well uh, I think the game of hockey is a lot in your head and if you if you work hard and, and you keep your confidence uh, it's, it's a big plus and uh, the one thing I try to do is work even harder and make sure I, I went harder every night and if you do that, then my dad always taught me uh, good things are going to happen to you, and uh, that's what has been happening lately. You think that despite the fact that things have gone well in recent games, that maybe one day down the road a trade is almost inevitable, that uh, you aren't going to finish your career with the Rangers, or you try not to think about that? Oh, I, I don't think about that at all. I know one thing in New York, and uh, Neil Smith is real fair with everybody. If you if you play hard and you, and you do what you're supposed to do, he's not going to trade you, and that's the way I feel. I, I like it in New York. I hope to finish my career there, and uh, you know things are going pretty good now. And when things are go good, it, it's a lot of fun when a team wins, and uh, there's no city like it. As hard as they can be, they could be the greatest fans too. And uh, for me, I like that. I like that challenge, and uh, you know I like the city too. So it's been a lot of fun, and uh, like I said, I hope I, I get to finish my career there. Luke, tell me about playing with Wayne Gretzky. There were those who wondered how you would coexist on the same team again. Uh, never mind the same line, but. Obviously, things are going well for the two of you and for Nicholas Sundstrom, too. 
Yeah, things have been going real good. Gretz has been uh, it's been good uh, from the beginning to me. Uh, he went out of his way to talk to me, and uh, and when we've started playing on the, uh, together, really uh, maybe like about the same thing about 12 or 13 games ago, we played a little bit at the beginning of the year, and then we got off the line, and then we came back. He, He's been playing great, and uh, for Sonny and I, it's just uh, we got to get open and uh, make sure we work hard. But if, if you get open with him, he'll find you. Especially if he's behind the net and you're open in front of it, he seems to find yeah, you. Yeah, he's not bad there. <laughs> he's been pretty good there in the past. <laughs> well, the best of the season to you, Luke. Uh, thanks for talking with us. All right, thanks, Dave. Luke Robitaille and the Rangers in Ottawa tonight. At the bottom of the hour, TSN's first of two games on the NHL tonight has the Montreal Canadiens in Pittsburgh. And the Habs know what everybody back home is asking. How will the team respond following one of the most humiliating home ice losses in club history? 6 nothing against Ottawa. We'll ask Montreal's leading goal scorer, Mark Recchi. Mark, do you want to try your hand at predicting what we'll see from the Canadians tonight? Well, I definitely, you'll, you'll definitely see a better effort than, uh, than we've, when we've shown the last little while. And, uh, I think this couple days was uh, this couple day break was hopefully going to be very good for us, and you'll see a good uh, a good team effort tonight. Is it uh, a game that'll be mentioned by Mario Trombley or anybody else uh, prior to this one tonight, or have you tried to forget about it? No, I think we're going to have to try and forget that one. That was uh, you know I think everybody realized that we were embarrassed, and, and uh, you know it was a real ugly display of hockey on our part. And if we can you know just forget about that one and try and get on with it, uh, you know we've got a really tough road trip here, and, and we. You know, we can turn this thing around if we uh, if we do well here. Now, is Pittsburgh uh, the best team you could be playing in this situation? Because, uh, boy, you better be ready for them under any circumstances or the way they're playing, maybe the worst team you could be facing. Well, hopefully, you know, we've played pretty well against them, uh, you know, since I've been in Montreal. It's been, uh, we've had fairly decent success against them. And if we can go out there and play a great game and, 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 and play a good game plan and, and, and work hard and try and shut down uh, Lemieux and Jaeger and Francis, then... Then, uh, you know, hopefully it'll be the start of a good road trip for us. I mean, it can start us on the right track if we go out there and, and uh, give the effort that we're going to need. Tell me how you deal with all the injuries that uh, surround you. Everybody says uh, you can't dwell on them. Every team has them. And yet, to try to play without uh, the players that are missing uh, has to be tough for any team and certainly for yours. Yeah, it's been tough. But, uh, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of guys that have, to, you know, had to step up and, and and take the spots of you know some very good players and you know they've done a good job to the part but you know we have to start playing better as a team and, and until we do that we're not going to be a uh, very good hockey club and, and we have to be uh, committed to playing together and and not like a bunch of individuals and i think that's where we've fallen into trouble where's the confidence level of the team because on certain nights it looks like a team that certainly can make the playoffs and uh, maybe cause trouble uh, on other nights you wonder if you're going to be in the playoffs well, I think it's it's not as great as it uh, we would like it right now, but like I said, we're hoping this road trip right now is we can put it we can put together uh, five solid games and and uh, you know go back home and uh, with some confidence and and take it from there and and make a big run out of here coming you know the next uh, you know 45 games. What has to be done to play better defensively because that is the one area that uh, certainly needs improvement uh, is it does it lie with goaltenders defensemen forwards i'm sure you're going to tell me all of the above well it, it is all of the above i mean it, we have to be committed together as a team and uh you know we can't be like i said we can't be individuals out there we have to you know defensively it's just you know it's really hard work and if you're not prepared to work hard then uh and pay the price you're not going to get the job done and i think we have to we have to realize that that's what it's going to take on a consistent basis every night i mean there's no easy games anymore in this league and uh, you know, you have to play hard every night and you have to be prepared to work. And, and if you don't, then obviously our record shows that, uh, you know, you're going to be in trouble. But, you know, it's a team that's built for speed and uh, built to score goals. Do you think it's a team capable of playing the kind of defensive hockey that seems necessary? Well, I think it's definitely capable if, if we get the commitment from everybody. And, uh, you know, we've got to, you know, when you have that speed, it should make defense a lot easier. I mean, uh, you know, you can match up against anybody and it's just a matter of paying the price. Well, uh, have fun paying the price tonight, whatever it takes to beat uh, Mario and uh, Yager and company. We'll watch with interest. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you very much. Elsewhere tonight on TSN, Vancouver at San Jose. It might sound obvious to say the Canucks have as many good games as bad games. They have a 500 record, and they always seem to have a 500 record. The last game was horrible, a 7-0 loss to Edmonton. The script then calls for a win tonight in San Jose. You'll see this one following the Montreal-Pittsburgh game. 
Florida at Tampa Bay. Fans of the Lightning have seen their team win only three times on home ice, but if there can be good news, uh, they're in most of those games. In posting a 3-9-3 and record at the new Ice Palace, they've seen their opponents outscore them by only nine goals. Tonight, the 26th place Lightning are hosting the first overall Florida Panthers. Washington is at Detroit during the first few weeks of the season. The Red Wings had the worst power play in the league. You knew that wouldn't last. And sure enough, they have climbed to ninth with Brendan Shanahan's eight power play goals leading the way. He is tied for the league lead with four other players. The Caps special teams compare favorably. It's the rest of their game that needs a lift. Devils and Islanders. When the Devils build a hot streak, you don't necessarily notice because it is built with defense, the Devils' seven-game unbeaten streak includes Monday's 0-0 tie with Buffalo. The Islanders need Ziggy Palfi to get hot again. He has been blank in four straight games. Hartford is at Buffalo while New Jersey tries to keep the net free of pucks again. So did the Sabres at home against the Whalers. This game is for first place in the Northeast Division, and that means it's also for second place in the conference. And later, Phoenix at Los Angeles. Phoenix is fourth in the West and yet only in a playoff spot by a margin of three points. The Kings haven't won in their last seven games, and if not for Toronto and Montreal, they would be the league's worst defensive team. Oh, how does that sound? Stay with us. That's Hockey. We'll tell you our plans for tomorrow, the 27th of this month of December, when we return in just a moment. Here are the final two clues under the helmet. He was selected by Anaheim in the 1993 expansion draft. And he scored a career-high 19 goals with the Ducks in the 1993-94 season. Uh, who's playing? Uh, I don't know. But it ain't us. Double header night. TSN tonight. Tonight's clues under the helmet. He was drafted 71st overall by Toronto in 1987. He played for Team USA at the 1992 Olympics. He was selected by Anaheim in the 1993 expansion draft, and he scored a career-high 19 goals with the Ducks in the 1993-94 season. Under the helmet tonight, Joe Sacco of the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. Tomorrow in this time slot, there's a basketball game, and we'll be on two hours earlier, or thereabouts, to follow Canada's first game at the World Junior Hockey Championships in Geneva. Look for that hockey at or about 5 o'clock Eastern time, and in addition to reaction to the Canada-Germany game, tomorrow's show will include reports on two famous ex-NHLers, referee Andy Van Helleman and a guy he used to know very well, Dave the Hammer Schultz. Nowadays, Andy has an office, and he helps to run the East Coast Hockey League, but he is remembered well from his 25 years in the National Hockey League. He's no nonsense guy. I think, you know, uh, you weren't going to uh, dictate the game, and he didn't tolerate any guys that, you know, abuse or, you know. They knew uh, just how far to go on and how far not to go and what they were saying and what they were doing. And as soon as he said, drop it, it was dropped right away. You put one in there. I've already explained it to you. You tell him what's going on. Right there. Buffalo's got a bench penalty. Two minutes. I just explained it to you. I just explained it to you. I just explained it to you. You go tell him if he wants to talk to me, I'm on the ice to talk to him. Andy Van Helleman's new job isn't too much of a departure from his old one. He's still a referee of sorts. Uh, but Dave Schultz has made a more dramatic relocation. No longer does he visit penalty boxes. Now he remains at the players' bench behind it as the coach of the Madison Monsters in the Colonial Hockey League, and he watches the fights from that vantage point. Straighten the arm out! Straighten the arm out! Don't jump down! Let's play hockey, boys! <laughs> hey, I mean, that, that is as close to being as slug as I've ever seen. I mean, he, he, he barely could get to near to the blue line, it seems. Join us tomorrow beginning at 5 Eastern time or following the Canada-Germany game for Dave Schultz and Andy Van Helleman, new jobs in different leagues. That's Hockey with Dave Hodge, brought to you by MasterCard, the official card and payment system of the NHL.
of events, this hockey season is bound to be remembered for all its shutouts. The ones the NHL could do without are those that feature one team playing well and the other team not playing at all. Nine times this season, a team has been shut out by six or more goals. And that's especially ugly when the losing team is the home team, as was the case in the two most recent shutout massacres in Vancouver and in Montreal. Now, you can theorize all you want about the record-breaking shutout pace, the four games that have ended 0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, there is not a theory that explains why certain teams on certain nights simply are not ready to play. Ten different teams have been beaten by six or more goals this season, some of them twice. The bad taste does not go away easily. Well, time to rev up the email and other forms of correspondence after Christmas. Here's how you can let us know what you're thinking about the NHL season or anything else related to hockey. There has been no fun in Habville for this Christmas for Mario Tremblay. The team's best player and top scorer is out with a knee injury. Their goaltending has been withering behind a defense that has allowed the most shots in the NHL. How bad is it? Last Saturday, number 99 set up in his office three times to beat Montreal. On Monday, the Senators, yes, Ottawa, humbled the Habs. So could the Christmas break be a fresh start? Yes, but not likely. Montreal meets Mario tonight in game one of a five-game road trip. Yarmer Jagger leads the NHL in scoring, while Mario Lemieux has eight goals in his last four games, along with Ron Francis. They have recorded 75 points in 15 games. Live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's the Montreal Canadiens. Gabe Fedorov's night. He's got four goals in the hockey game. This one goes into overtime, and guess who gets the winner? Sergei Fedorov beats Carey for his fifth goal of the hockey game. That's the winner for the Wings. The emotion and the elation pretty much says it all for the Detroit Red Wings as they pull off the victory. And we should qualify that. It wasn't the Detroit Red Wings with the victory tonight. Coming up on Sports Desk, the Red Wings' Sergei Fedorov decapitates the Capitals. Murray and the Canucks try to avoid the Sharks' bite. The Kings' passing is divine as they go hunting for Coyote. The Mavericks send their number one gunslinger out of town. Now he'll be riding into the Phoenix Sunset. The Raptors are ferocious, keeping the Nets away from the net. And Detroit finally sends Wayne Fox to the Lions. What do you mean I'm fired? What's the deal? Hey, things can't be that bad. Turn that crown upside down, because Sports Desk is next. Welcome to Sports Desk, everyone. I'm Teresa Cruz. Boxing Day is usually a day of recovery and shopping. But for one player of the Detroit Red Wings, forget about the recovery time in the malls. He went on a goal-scoring spree. I'll tell you, someone sure has lit a fire under Sergei Fedorov lately. After scoring just four goals in Detroit's first 21 games, Fedorov has finally found his scoring touch. And Thursday night, he single-handedly scorched the Washington Capitals. Here's a look at the man of the hour. At this point, Fedorov has two goals in the game. Pick it up, third period, wings down three to two. Watch Vladimir Konstantinov, a perfect speed to Fedorov, puts it in the open net for his fourth career hat trick, and this game's all tied up at three. Less than a minute later, Caps regain the lead. Sergei Gonchar, shot stop. Dale Hunter there for the rebound, and the Caps go up four to three. However, 39 seconds later, the Caps can't clear. Igor Larionov to Fedorov, puts it into the open net for his fourth goal of the night. We've got a tie game again, 4-4. Overtime. Kozlov to Konstantinov, drops for Fedorov, picks the lower corner. His fifth goal of the game, the Wings win it 5-4, and old Fedorov just can't believe it. Quite frankly, we can't either. It's the second time that Fedorov has scored four in a game. His fourth career hat trick, and Vladimir Konstantinov assisted on four of Fedorov's goals. 
The Vancouver Canucks began a two-game road trip Thursday night in San Jose. Just three nights previous, the Canucks were embarrassed by Edmonton when the Oilers blanked them 7 to nothing. Their leading scorer, Alexander McGillney, has 30 points but has not scored since December the 15th. Let's see if he can't think, get things going. And they got off to a bad start for the Canucks. 15 seconds in, Andre Nazarov centering attempt goes off of Adrian O'Coin and in behind Corey Hirsch. The Sharks have got a one to nothing. Later on, Todd Gill flattens Pavel Bure with a big check. But Bure was okay. Then the Canucks pressuring. Martin Jelena gets it to Alexander McGillney. Kelly Rudy stopped that shot. Mike Ridley fires the backhand wide. McGillney picks it up, puts the puck through the crease. Ridley finally banging at home. It's 1-1. Second period, the Sharks up 2-1. to one. Tony Granato comes out front. His shot deflected to Owen Nolan. Puts the biscuit in the basket. It's 3-1. to one. San Jose still in the second. 4-1 to one Sharks. Victor Kozlov feeds Al Iofredi, and he beats first from the slot. Five to one Sharks, they go on to win this one handily by a final count of six to one. This is the first time in 23 games that the Sharks have scored six goals in a night, and they did it against the Canucks. Bernie Nichols, Tony Granato, and Owen Nolan, Owen Nolan each had three points for San Jose. Now on to Pittsburgh, facing the Montreal Canadiens, Mario Tremblay and company, trying to rebound from a six to nothing shellacking by the Senators the other night. They get off to a flying start. Scott Thornton picks up the loose puck, fires the wrist shot, screened by Stevenson, and it's one to nothing. Heads up two to nothing. Scott Thornton again, all alone at the side of the net, fires at home. It's three to nothing, Montreal after one. To the third period, more bad news for the Pens. Stefan Richet with a shot. Ken Reagan injures himself, trying to make the save, had to leave the game. Well, then the Pens just explode. Three to one. Francis shot takes a crazy bounce. Yager knocks in the rebound. And later on, it was Nedved with a shot. Mario Lemieux knocks home the rebound, tied up at three. They came back, back but had to settle for the tie. The Pens are now unbeaten in four. They're 3-0-1. Oh, and, and the word on Ken Reggett, strained hamstring. He'll be evaluated on Friday, but they are expecting him to be out seven to ten days. On we go now to Hartford and Buffalo. Dominic Hasek has seen more shots this year than any other goalie, but hey, he could take this night off. Less than a minute in. Dixon Ward to Brian Holzinger, and he zings it in. One-timer. One and nothing for the Sabres. Later on in the first, Michael Panther will trip. Andrew Castles in the neutral zone. No call on that. That allows Adam Burke to send it in for Pekka, and he'll tip it in. It's three to nothing for the Sabres. Well, that's it for Jason Mazzotti. John Sebastian Giguere is in, and Mark Jansen gives him a little pep talk, but it was no help. The Sabres keep going. Dixon Ward, a pretty pass to Donald Odette, dumps it into the open net. Sabres up 5 to nothing. On to the third period, and listen to this. Wow. Yeah, did you hear that? Glenn Wesley, hit by Donald Odette's blast, did not return to play. Seeing a few stars there, and the Whalers fall 5 to 1 was the final score. So the first place Sabres now lead Hartford by three points in the Northeast. Take two teams on a high, mix well, stir it up, and what have you got? A bit of a surprise. Thursday, the high-flying New York Rangers, 11-1-1 in their last 13 games, travel to Ottawa to take on the Senators, who were still celebrating their 6 to nothing shutout of the Montreal Canadiens. Let's pick it up here midway through the first sends on the power play. Alexi Yashin with the wraparound is one nothing sends. Later on, Denny Chasse drops it to Jason Zent, and he rips it home. First NHL goal, 2 to nothing for the Sens. Second period, Daniel Alfredson's shot hits the defenseman. However, Yashin grabs a loose puck. It's 3 to nothing for the Senators. Later on, Ottawa's up 3 to 1. Sergei Zoltok to Wade Redden, back to Zoltok. 4 to 1 for the Sens as they go on to surprise another team. New York Rangers following, falling to Ottawa, 5 to 2. That's the Sens' first ever home win over the Rangers. The Rangers' five-game win streak is now over, as is Wayne Gretzky's 12-game point scoring streak. Now let's move on to the Islanders and the Devils, and assistant coach Rick Bonus behind the bench with Mike Milberg scouting at the World Junior Tourney. And the Islanders get off to a slow start in this one. First period, Dave Andercheck has two chances but can't put it in. Steve Thomas buries the rebound, one and nothing for the Devils. Let's move ahead to the third period. It's all tied up at one, and the Devils fall apart. Zygmunt Palfi in all alone and shorthand. It goes five hole for his 21st goal of the year. Two to one for the Islanders. Moments later, Derek King goes down the wing. Rips a pass. Brodeur for his 200th career NHL goal. Three to one, New Jersey. Then with Brodeur on the bench, 
Brian Smolinski will pick up the loose puck at center ice. Has a wide open net, but Sean Chambers holds him down, but Smolinski awarded the goal. The Islanders go on to win it 4-1. to The Devils Club record five-game road win streak is now over. To the battle now, the Sunshine State, the Panthers and the Lightning. Dino Cicerelli leading the Lightning with 16 goals this year. Dino planted in front of Mark Fitzpatrick, and Drew Bannister shot, finds the net. one to nothing, Tampa. Doug McLean giving an earful to Mark Fassett about Dino's presence in the goal crease. Let's go to the second period, 2 to nothing, Tampa Bay. Carlisle floats a pass to Martin Strack, and they tip their Florida down by one. But Lightning strikes again. Dana Blankow breaks in short-handed, and then we'll just flip it over Fitzpatrick. Tampa up 3-1 to one after two. In the third period, Florida down by one and pressing. Dave Lowry finally stuffs it in. The Battle of the Sunshine State ends in a 3-3 tie. Rick Tamborachi making 35 saves for Tampa Bay. Time for our first break, but stick around. More hockey as the Kings look to crown the Coyotes in L.A. And Jason Kidd is... That foul smell in the air over the Great Western Forum in Los Angeles can't be blamed on the pollution lately. It's been the play of the Los Angeles Kings, winless in their last seven. Thursday night, they took on a bunch of Coyotes from the desert. Phoenix had won five of its last six going in. Let's see if they won this one. Kings smoking in the first on the power play. Norman and Feeds Philip Boucher and blasts it home. There it goes. One to nothing for the Kings. Then Los Angeles adds another. Ray Ferraro with a no-look pass finds Brad Smith and it's two to nothing for Los Angeles. Still in the first period, the Kings continue to pour it on. Dmitry Tristich, a great move to Vladimir Siplikov, puts it home. It's three to nothing.